it's the right one. Right, okay, morning folks. Hello, um, welcome to, um, to today's talk, after Akhenaten, Nefertiti, Smenkare, and where were they all buried? Um, lots of you will already probably have heard me say a few minutes ago that um, this, is, this is a repeat, it's a repeat of a talk that I gave um, early on in the lockdown last year, um, almost exactly a year ago, in fact, I realised after I'd set this up. Um, it, it's still the most popular, single most popular um, talk I've given in, in the last year or so. So I thought, you know, it might be, might be worth putting on again. And um, in fact, it's, uh, it's been about as popular again as, as anything else, um, even though I suspect some of you here uh, will probably have been at um, one of the first uh, sessions. So this is the fifth time I've given this talk. Um, I ought to know what I'm doing by now. Anyway, let's see. So um, we're going to be talking about a very brief period um, in Egyptian history, really, um, when you think about how far back in time um, these events took place, and these, these people were around. Um, we're talking about the period uh, after Akhenaten's death, for the most part, period in between that point and the death of Tutankhamun, which um, is a is a milestone in that um, it, it kind of brings the Amarna period to an end. The, the sort of start and end points are, are a bit fluid and subject to discussion, but um, for, for the purpose of today's talk, at least, that's the period in question. So death of Akhenaten and then um, the rule of at least, uh, I think, two uh, other pharaohs whose identities we'll see, one of them, Tutankhamun, and his death brings, brings this period to an end. It's, it's perhaps a period of not much more than a decade, which in ancient history terms, as I say, is a very short period of time indeed. And we're going to be looking at two main questions. One is, who were the people concerned? So who were those pharaohs uh, who were on the throne uh, at the end of Akhenaten's uh, life? Um, and then where were these individuals buried. Um, and so we're going to be talking about Nefertiti, Smenkare, Akhenaten himself, Tutankhamun, uh, and possibly one or two others as well. Um, we talked a little bit in the chat um, just now about tangents. Um, I don't deliberately go off on tangents. That things just occur to me every so often. Um, and um, in preparing for this talk, although it's a repeat, I do feel a little bit bad about it. And I I just couldn't bring myself to do exactly the same talk. So this is tweaked and revised. And th there was one thing which it seemed to me very obvious to include today, given the recent developments in Egypt. So before we get on to the subject, the main subject of today's lecture, I just thought I would cover something a little bit, only a little bit different. So we're, we're going to be talking about after Akhenaten for most of the time, but just briefly here, we're going to pause um on the period before Akhenaten um and just to orient us actually I, I realized I do often like to talk uh, or start my talks with um kind of the chronological and uh, geographical setting and actually I, I hadn't put anything like that into this talk in in its first version so um no harm in having a little king list here on the, so on the left hand side you can see um, a list of the names of the kings of the 18th dynasty, beginning with Ahmose the first and ending with um, the man who was Tutankhamun's um, commander in chief of the armies, Horam Heb. And the, the period in question today, of course, is the, um, the, the second half of this period, um, beginning with Amenhotep IV, the king who was crowned Amenhotep IV, who changed his name after a few years to Akhenaten. So changing his name from something like Amun is satisfied, the god Amun is satisfied to Ark en Arten, effective for the Arten, signifying this great change away from the worship of Amun to the worship of the Arten. Amun Hotep IV Akhenaten uh, was unquestionably uh, the son of the previous king, Amun Hotep III, who we see here in the photograph. Um, this is a statue of his. Many of you will be familiar with it. It's in the Luxor Museum now. It was discovered in the early 90s, I think it was 92, by Mohammed al Sugaya, um, an Egyptian excavator um, in the Luxor Temple during renovations in the, in the sun court of this very king, Amenhotep III. It was one of a number of extremely fine statues which had been deliberately buried by the Egyptians in one of these statue caches. 
it's nowhere near as big as the um, as, as the cache that was found by Georges Legrand at the beginning of the 20th century in um, Karnak, but nonetheless, it was very spectacular. And this is probably the the the, the single best piece, a really beautiful statue of, of Amenhotep III from the later period in his reign, when uh, his images were beginning to look a little bit strange, a little bit sort of extreme. Um, so he has these um, characteristically almond shaped eyes and very um, crisply defined lips, eyes, eyelids and eyebrows with um, cosmetic eye extensions. Um, he has a strange appearance. Actually, this angle of the photograph doesn't really show it to the full extent. Um, it is a very beautiful statue, but it's also an, an odd one. And the reason um, I just thought we, we would, we should perhaps pause in the reign of Amenhotep III is because of this uh, announcement made um, last week, I think it was, of a, as the headline says here, lost golden city, um, found in Egypt, um, reveals lives of ancient pharaohs. I first heard about this actually a few weeks ago. Um, the excavations have been underway for several months, so the, 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 the news of this discovery has been kept under, under wraps for quite a long time. Um, and when I first heard about it, I first heard about it via a funny, uh, funny route, actually. Dr. Zahi um, Hawass, who's the director of these excavations, most prominent um, Egyptian archaeologist in Egypt, of course, um, Zahi's involved in so many different projects that he's in a privileged position of being able to announce discoveries all the time. And he was interviewed a few weeks ago um, and said to the interviewer, I am about to make an amazing discovery. Um, and I was called by a very bad journalist from a very bad tabloid newspaper um, at the time saying, Chris, what's this discovery Dr. Zahi is about to announce? And I said, I don't know. Could be anything, couldn't it? Dr. Zahi excavates everywhere. Dr. Zahi has been excavating in the Valley of the Kings, for example. And um, I know that he's been looking for the tombs of, in fact, a monoperiod pharaoh. So, but who knows? I mean, if you found uh, uh, something spectacular there, wouldn't that be great, wouldn't it? But I have no idea what, what he might be about to announce. Anyway, the bad journalist from the bad newspaper wrote a news story about this saying, Dr. Chris says Dr. Zahi is about to make discovery in the Valley of the Kings. Not what I'd said, but this is what the tabloids do. As a result of that, a colleague of mine phoned me up and said, do you know what Zahi is about to announce? Sounds like you do. So I said, no. I said, oh, well, and he told me what it was. And uh, uh, he told me about this lost city, apparently discovered in um, the area uh, in, around Medina Harbu, um, that sort of area. And I was astonished. At first, I just thought, are you sure? That, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't sound right. That's such a well-known part of the world. It's right in the, well, the sort of the southern end, but it's right in the middle of this inc uh, incredibly rich archaeological area that's been visited not only by archaeologists, but by thousands of tourists in pre-COVID times every day. Thousands of people will, will roll right by this site every day. I, and also, we know there's archaeological material in there. I just can't believe anything that's really new has been found in this place. Anyway, I, I was wrong. It looks like they really have made a actually really very exciting and potentially very important discovery in this area but I thought it'd be worth just maybe clarifying a few things because some of the news stories have um uh well they're based on um on um on a press release which is itself a little bit short of detail as they inevitably are and a little bit vague in places and also a little bit colored by hyperbole hence lost golden city which doesn't really mean anything it's not golden it was lost in that we didn't know it was there and now we do um but we had no sort of hint that there was anything there it's not as though people have been looking for it particularly. Anyway, um, as I say, this is an area um, of the uh, Theban um, West Bank, um, Theban cemeteries, which is, it's hardly as though, you know, nobody's ever done the archaeology there before. Um, the area concerned is, is down here. What I was told is that it was sort of in between Medina Harbu, which is the temple enclosure surrounding the mortuary temple of Ramesses III of the 20th dynasty, which is down here, um, and the Colossi of Memnon. The Colossi are two enormous statues of um, Amenhotep III. I'm sure you'll know them very well. They appear to be sort of freestanding in the cultivated land, but actually they would originally have stood at the front of that king's memorial temple. Um, and the footprint of that temple um, is, is roughly here. And of course, both these memorial temples are among this great sequence built by New Kingdom kings 
they're not physically connected uh, with their tombs, but they are symbolically connected um, with them, the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. So where in previous periods you would have the Tomb of the King, um, often surmounted by a pyramid with a, 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 a temple dedicated to the memory, the mortuary cult of that king right next door, um, those buildings are still both there, the tomb and the temple in the New Kingdom, it's just that they're separate. Now, so the tombs are hidden away in the wadis, the, the mountains, the temples all the way um, uh, down here at the edge of the cultivation, which is this wavy line we see here, and the temples all the way, generally speaking, along the edge of it. So this is the area here. And this is the area, as you can see, where we're in fact relevant uh, to today, we have a, a temple of um, Iron Horum Heb. It's, it has been speculated in the past often that this was also originally a temple of Tutankhamun, although the evidence for that's very, very scanty. Temple of Amenhotep, son of Hapu here, another of Tuthmosis II. Um, the temple's just labelled south and north here. Um, so there's archaeology in, in this area, and, and this is well known. Um, this incidentally is a plan from, uh, from, from Porter and Moss. The other thing, which of course is in this area, just a, a little way off, um, off the map in this sort of direction, southwest, is that um, there is a kind of um, a, a settlement um, aspect to the archaeology in this area um, as well, specifically the palace complexes of Amenhotep III at the site we now call Malkata. These are some photographs I took from a hot air balloon a few years ago. This is um, this is one part of the temple complex of um, Amenhotep III. Um, it, there's not really very much to see on on the ground. Some of you may have have wandered over there um, from time to time. It's it's possible to see the the low rem remains of low walls, mud brick walls. Um, there is actually some painted plaster still extant in some places. Um, the other thing that's, that is visible, although you really need to get um, up to a certain height, either in a balloon or, um, uh, or even if you climb up into the, in the hills and you, you know where you're looking, you'll be able to see these um, large um, rectangular mounds. They're sort of shallow enough in, in the landscape that when you're down on the ground, it's very difficult to sort of tell what they are. And they're so big that you can only really see one at a time. You don't get this sense of a row of them. Um, as here. What these are, are they are spoil dumps which were created um, when uh, the so-called Birkit Habu, the lake of, of Habu, it was like, more like a sort of lake or harbour, was created by Amenhotep III. And this, this was created by digging an enormous hole in the ground, essentially. Um, and the spoil was, was placed in these regular heaps around the edge in a rectangular shape. So the harbour itself now shows up as just sort of blank looking deserts, but the spoil heaps give it the shape. Um, it would have looked something like um, something like this, we think. So you can see um, in this reconstruction by the French artist Jean-Claude Gauvin, um, these spoil dumps, that's what we were looking at in the previous photograph. This is the palace complex of Malkata um, uh, behind it here. Uh, with the uh, mortuary temple of Amenhotep III over here um, and the colossi of Memnon at the front. So this is the sort of Theban landscape in the time of Amenhotep III. Um, incidentally, the, the, the Birkit Habu, the Lake of Habu, shows up best in satellite images. So you can see if it, we're looking here, obviously the green is the cultivated land, the light colours are the sandy desert. Those spoiled dumps are, are at the edge here. Um, the Malkata um, remains, uh, the remains of the palace complexes of Amenhotep III are in this sort of area um, here. Um, and if you can, you can probably make out this sort of shape here um, of brown and, and grey, which is buildings, people's houses and streets and things. Um, that is the shape of this huge uh, Burkitt. So keep your eyes T-shaped basin. That's exactly what, what we're looking at here in the satellite image. It's great fun if you go into Google Earth um, finding, finding this. 
Um, uh, an EES team led by Angus Graham actually in the last few years has been doing work in, in this area um, to try and determine whether or not it was really viable as a, as a harbour, whether or not it actually had water in, because it, it is quite a long way away from the, from the river over here, of course, and that same team under Angus has, has been doing a lot of work in showing that the river moved, but we know that it never moved as far west as, as to be over here. Um, but there was a canal, it seems, connecting the harbour with the river. And in fact, the, the research shows that yes, um, it was viable, it was filled with water, and in fact, it wasn't even seasonal. It, it, it was filled with water year round, I think, um, I think I'm think i right in saying, um, for, for a period of, of, of over a decade. So it was, it was genuinely a, a, um, a viable, a viable harbour. And in terms of the volume, by the way, fun fact, uh, folks, um, in terms of the quantity of debris excavated from the ground in order to create this vast uh, lake, um, it's bigger than the Great Pyramid, which makes it the biggest construction project in Egyptian history. Fun fact. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scale, um, for those of you who know Medina Harbu, it's a very large memorial temple of Ramses III, associated buildings and a very large um, enclosure wall. This is Medina Harbu over here. That's the extent of the enclosure wall. So compare that to the size of this harbour. Um, it would have been very spectacular indeed. So we know that Amenhotep III is doing a lot in this area already. We've got the Burkitt Habu, the Malkata Palace complexes, Colossi of Memnon and Temple as well. The area that, um, that's been under excavation recently is, as, as, um, as I was told right from the off, um, in between Medina Habu here, um, and um, Komal Hetan, the um, Temple of Amenhotep III over here, somewhere in this, in this area here. Um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Vicky Jensen, um, has been very active on Facebook um, lately, um, and she's been going back into historic um, excavation plans to, to show how this ties in with previous work. So um, this is the uh, this is the Burkitt Habu here. This is a plan from the um, Oriental Institute, University of Chicago excavations of Medina Habu and the, the wider area. The Burkitt Habu is here. This is, as it says, the palace and town of Amenhotep III. This is the um, the temple with the colossi at the front. The new excavations are are here. So a little bit sort of um, north and west, if you like, of that temple area in between, um, and sort of edging over towards Daryl Medina, which is which is over here behind um, uh, behind the uh, the hill here. Um, and this is uh, another. Um, so combination plan and satellite image again provided by Vicky Jensen, brilliant work she's done here um, to show this is the edge of Medina Harbu here. This is the um, this is the, what, what remains of the mortuary temple of Iron Horum Heb here. This is the Amenhotep son of Hapu temple. Um, and this is the area of the new excavation. She also points out that in 1934 to five, I didn't know this, some French excavations uh, uncovered some domestic buildings of the time of Amenhotep III uh, in this area here. So, you know, my, my first thought was, you know, what, as I was saying, there, there can't be anything in this area. Can there really be anything new to find in this area? Well, I was wrong on that count, yes, and clearly there, there is. It is a little way away, as you can see from the, the temples I had in mind, so I guess these earlier excavations just missed it and it didn't show up in any kind of survey work that had been done previously. That was my thought, was that the area had been comprehensively field walked, test excavations, etc. Aerial photography, nothing had shown up previously. Um, but, um, and I think this is maybe the most important sort of point I might make here. When, when, I, when this first um, made its way online, the announcement made its way online, there was lots of chatter, of course, in social media and online. Um, among the first responses I saw to it when I posted the news um, were, firstly, don't believe anything Dr. Zahi says. Um, he didn't discover it. This sounds like rubbish, probably not even a new discovery. Well, um, that, that was wrong. It really is new material, just to be clear. Um, Dr. Zahi's not lying here. This is really new stuff. The second thing that, that cropped up is was a comment um, put rather forcefully, I thought, um, on my Facebook wall saying, um, Chris, you know this was discovered in 1917. And I thought, well, hang on. Yes, I think you're, you, to this person, I think you're talking about Malkata. Um, which, yes, of course, we, we, we've known about actually since before 1917. Um, we know about very, very well. 
And I had thought all along that if there's um, a settlement site at the time of Amenhotep III in this area, there's no way it can't be connected with Malkata. But again, that doesn't mean that this is not new material, it is. But it seems likely that all these excavations, the, the, the Malkata remains, which have been, have been studied by num a number of teams over the years, most recently by a, a team involving Peter Lacavara and various people from the Metropolitan Museum of, of Art. There's a, um, a site, a website, iMalkata, which has been following their excavations. That's excellent. Um, by the way, I recommend that. Google iMalkata. Um, uh, the French excavations of 34 to 35, and now the new Egyptian excavations. And these all seem to have been picking up the same settlement and extending what we know about it. Um, uh, and uh, this is all really very exciting. Um, so you will have seen, no doubt, um, photographs of extremely well-preserved walls, including these um, incredible um, wavy looking walls, sinusoidal walls, they're called. We, we have evidence of these from elsewhere, particularly from the Middle Kingdom. Um, from places like Bu Hen, um, also from funerary contexts. Um, we see these in funerary enclosures at Abydos and Dashur uh, and elsewhere. Um, their functions are not quite, um, not quite clear, but in any case, they, um, they are extremely well preserved here. And the material that's coming out of these um, buildings uh, includes some very fine blue painted pottery, which is very characteristic of the um, mid 18th dynasty into early 19th, so exactly the right time. Um, and then we also have a number of jars, which, um, I, and, and this kind of thing, kind of material, which bears inscriptions, um, you can probably just about make out a hieratic label on this jar, which begins if you're really eagle eyed with a date um, formula. So this, this won't be a terribly exciting inscription um, in as much as it, it will only record date and then the commodity that's that's inside the jar, perhaps oil or wine, and where it came from, where in, where in the Egyptian empire it came from. But collectively, inscriptions like this can be very helpful. Um, of course, they help to date um, the site, um, but they can also help us to sort of show sequences of events as well. And it seems from all the material gathered so far that this is indeed um, settlement of um, the uh, the later period of Amenhotep, the third's reign, and possibly into the time of Akhenaten. And if that's right, then this may have been where Akhenaten was basing himself and his administration prior to the move to Imana. So this may help us to understand um, how that, that transition to a brand new capital city in the desert was made. Um, and in that respect, it's really very exciting. And it may help us to connect Akhenaten's um, revolution back to some of the ideas that we know were already developing in the reign of Amenhotep III, including the idea of planning on a kind of citywide scale. So, you know, as, as we've seen, apart from the palace complex and, and town that we're now seeing more and more of, um, Amenhotep had this giant harbour, he had his mortuary temple, um, and it seems he, he was also building on the east side of the river as well. We know he was building it at Luxor, but there's a suspicion that there's an, another parallel um, harbour on, on the east, in which case he was, he was creating this vast city that you can only really see from um, satellite images. And we know that that's the same kind of level of planning that Akhenaten was indulging in at Amana too. So, so we might be seeing connections more and more clearly thanks to this new, um, new work. So there we go. Um, that's uh, the new material. I hope, I hope that was um, useful and, and interesting. Um, it, you know, new discoveries get made in Egypt uh, more or less all the time, it seems, and they're often treated as sensational. Um, they don't always um, bring us very much new in information, even if they do bring us really, really beautiful material. Um, but I think in, in this case, um, for my money, this is about as important a discovery as, as we've had for quite a long time. So it is very exciting. Um, so to, to today's talk, um, cycling forward to the end of um, Akhenaten's reign, we know that he died um, in his 17th year. We don't have any um, evidence for his having reigned longer than this. Not a very, very long reign, um, but he managed to cram an awful lot um, into it, of course. So this, this represents the, the sort of beginning, if you like, of our story today. At the end of the period under question, just to... Um, just to, just to frame uh, the period under study. Um, Tutankhamun, um, of course, fantastically well known thanks to the discovery of his tomb. He was, as um, I'm sure most of you will know, an Amarna pharaoh. 
He was born, um, we, we think, probably into the Amana royal family. We don't know his parentage for sure, of, of course. Um, but he probably was born into the royal family, probably at Amana, and probably spent his early years um, at Amana. But it's during his time that the transition um, back to the old ways was, it seems, completed, even if it hadn't begun um, during his reign, even if it was re already on the way a little bit before that. It's clear from um, various different bits of evidence that, um, that he was an Amarna pharaoh. Um, some uh, of that evidence comes from the tomb itself. Um, so this throne, for example, Carter object number 91, um, on display as here in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. I'm not sure where it is now. It will make its way to the Grand Egyptian Museum eventually if it hasn't done so already. Um, it's clearly an, an Amarna style um, piece. And this scene um, on the back of the throne um, makes that very clear. The, the art and sun disc, Akhenaten's great god, is, is present at the top in the center of the scene with its beneficent rays terminating in little hands. Um, reaching down towards the king on the left um, and his queen Angsen Amun um, on the right. Um, both of them are shown not in the very rigid style that Egyptian art, um, certainly before the Amarna period, would require, but in a much looser, um, more languid sort of um, style, allowing for more kind of naturalistic poses to be adopted by the king who's reclining on this chair, one arm, um, sort of lying lazily on it on its back and the, the queen reaching forward um, reaching out towards the king and placing an arm on his shoulder in a very sort of touching and intimate scene um, the the older conventions of, of art which did return largely after the Amarna period um, wouldn't really allow for a scene that sort of has so much fluidity and movement as this things are much more rigid as I'm sure you'll uh, you'll be aware not only that, but the, um, the, the names of both these individuals, the king and queen, crop up on this throne on a number of occasions, um, in different, different places on the throne. Uh, and the names include both the earlier and later forms of both their names. So we know Tutankhamun and the king best by that name, Tutankhamun, the living image of the god Amun. Um, but in fact, he was crowned um, under a different name, which does crop up on this throne. Tutank Aten, essentially the same name, but with the Amun part replaced by the name of the god Aten. So he was crowned as a living image of the Aten, not the living image of Amun. And in the same way, Anxen Amun was originally Anxen Pa Aten uh, when, she was, uh, when she was born and in the early part of their reign. Um, that change of name is a part of the transition back to the old Amun worshipping ways. Um, and that's the name that we see on on uh, on most of the uh, equipment in the tomb of Tutankhamun, and we see it um, here in the, the full titulary of the king on this very fine block uh, from uh, from Karnak, from a, a building of Tutankhamun's now lost king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar Ra, the son of Ra, Tutankhamun, um, the ruler of southern Heliopolis. Um, the clearest indication, though, that Tutankhamun um, was the the pharaoh. Um, probably more than any other during whose reign the transition back to the old ways took place is this um, great stealer um, broken into several pieces and damaged by these grooves which at some point were cut down the front but it's nonetheless otherwise in pretty good condition and the inscription survives quite well. Um, uh, the cartouches were usurped by Horam Heb but um, it's, it's clear this was originally a monument of Tutankhamun's and it's come to be known as the restoration stealer because the text describes this restoration. Um, just to give you a, a sort of a flavor of it, in one passage, the inscription says, now when his majesty, Tutankhamun, that is, arose as king, meaning when he was crowned, the temples of the gods and goddesses had fallen into neglect. Their shrines had fallen into desolation. Their sanctuaries were as if they had never been. Their halls were a trodden path. The land was in confusion. The gods forsook this land. And his majesty has made monuments for the gods. This is, this is um, what Tutankhamun decides to do about it. And his majesty has made monuments for the gods, building anew their sanctuaries as monuments of eternal age. He has added to what was in former time. He has surpassed that done since the time of the ancestors. He has multiplied their wealth. So Tutankhamun finds the, the Egyptian temples um, having fallen into disrepair. They were abandoned, it seems, um, in earlier times. 
clearly as a result of Akhenaten having um, forbidden the worship of all gods pretty much apart from the the Aten, depriving the temples of their their income, their personnel, uh, etc. And Tutankhamun not only restores them but makes them better than they ever were, which is exactly what you would expect of a of a good pharaoh. So it's absolutely clear that you know this this is these were the steps that were taken in order to put Egypt back um, in the way that it was before. Um, Tutankhamun himself um, died at a very young age, as we know from, um, from his mummy, somewhere between 18 and, and 20, having ruled into a ninth year. Uh, he had no children by this point, although um, he had done his best um, to bring that about. Um, and so it seems there were no other members of the royal family um, who were considered suitable to take on the throne and so it passed to a commoner and we see that very clearly in this scene on the left hand side which is from the north wall of the burial chamber in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, Tutankhamun is on the left um, in white in the guise of Osiris so he is in, in some sense merged with, with uh, the god Osiris indicating that he, he has died by this point. Um, and his pose suggests that he, he has adopted the form of a mummy. And the figure on the right is his successor, the God's father. It's a kind of priestly, slightly obscure, but sort of priestly title, which I often, very often uses, and which in fact is enclosed within his cartouche, showing how important that was to his uh, status. Um, I uh, was a, a high ranking member of the royal court under Akhenaten and into the time of Tutankhamun. And he is wearing a leopard skin garment here, showing him to be playing the role of a, of a priest, a sem priest, and holding a, an object which we call an ads, a tool called an ads, uh, which he's going to use to perform the ritual of the opening of the mouth for breathing. And this is a very well established, well known ritual, which was performed on the mummy of the deceased at the point it enters the tomb. So the, the point of burial, the end of the funerary ceremony, and the idea is that this implement will open the mouth so that the individual can breathe again and be sort of reborn into the next life. And this is traditionally performed by the eldest son, um, the one who is going to succeed and, and take over the, the running of the family. Um, in this case, of course, I is, is not the son of Tutankhamun, he's not a member of the same family, um, but he adopts this um, garb and is shown in this act so as to emphasise the fact that he is the, the designated successor of Tutankhamun as pharaoh. Um, and that's all confirmed by the fact that along with his Sempri's garb, he's also wearing the blue crown uh, with the uraeus and his name is enclosed in a cartouche above and he's given the full uh, titulary king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Kepa Keperu Ra, and the son of Ra, the god's father, Ai. Um, following Ai, who was probably um, at quite an advanced age when uh, he came to the throne himself, um, the, the throne then passed to another commoner, another senior official from the time of Tutankhamun, um, the commander in chief of his armies, um, as we've already mentioned, um, Horam Heb, who already had a very beautiful tomb at Saqqara. Um, I, in fact, already had a, a very beautiful, um, partly finished tomb at Amarna, which was obviously abandoned at the point the city was, um, was abandoned. Um, uh, I came to have a, a tomb, number 57, cut in the Valley of the Kings, a little way up the main branch of the valley from Tutankhamun's tomb. And this um, uh, scene on the right is from that extremely finely, beautifully decorated um, tomb and his cartouches very nicely visible uh, here, Jason Keperu Ra, Setup En Ra, um, Horem Heb, beloved of Am. So that's, um, that takes us to the end of the 18th dynasty. Tutankhamun represents the end of this Amarna period, um, if you like, and the end of the royal, the 18th dynasty royal line, possibly even the end of the 17th and 18th dynasty royal line, depending on um, how you interpret family relations at the, the juncture of those um, two dynasties. Um, so the question is what happened in between, towards the end of the reign of Akhenaten, after his death, um, and leading up to the reign and death of Tutankhamun. It is possible that Tutankhamun succeeded Akhenaten directly. So in other words, Akhenaten died and Tutankhamun took over immediately. But in any case, there were other pharaohs um, about whom we now have 
um, a, a good body of evidence. So the question is, who were they and how do they fit into the sequence? The first of these individuals we're going to look at is Pharaoh Ankheperu Ray Semenkar Ray. The best evidence we have for this individual comes from um, one of the elite tombs at Amarna, um, part of the northern group of tombs. It's the tomb of a man called Meri Ra, the second um, individual with the tomb in this area by that name. So we call him Meri Ra the second. Um, and this scene um, appears in uh, the first chamber in the tomb behind um, a couple of columns to the right of a doorway. And it's adjacent to um, a so-called Durbar scene. And um, what we're looking at uh, is uh, an image which, if you ignore the inscriptions, if you put the inscriptions to one side, you would think was a classic image of Akhenaten and Nefertiti and the Aten. So the Aten sun disk in itself is, is missing, but it would, it would clearly have been here. Here are the Aten's rays reaching down, um, little hands at the ends, this one offering an ankh sign um, to the smaller of the two figures. The larger one in the center wearing clearly a, a blue crown, also being offered a little ankh um, here, um, the, the Aten giving this individual life. Um, this is uh, the king, Pharaoh, and next to him, his great royal wife. And of course, over and over again, we see scenes like this from Amarna depicting Akhenaten and Nefertiti. However, although um, most of the, uh, the label text identifying these individuals had disappeared by the time this drawing was made, it was made by Norman de Garris Davis, um, an English um, clergyman and um, Egyptologist um, who was working for the Egypt Exploration Fund, copying all the inscriptions in these tombs and the beginning of the 20th century, the label text would have been up here and you see a great big gap in uh, de Garris Davis's drawing here. But he was fortunate that um, uh, earlier in the middle of the 19th century, in the 1840s, um, the uh, inscriptions had been copied when the label text was still there by Carl Rickard Lepsius and co. And um, de Garris Davis restored the cartouches um, using Lepsius's drawing down here in the in the bottom right hand corner of the plate from de Garris Davis's publication. And these cartouches show us that the two individuals are respectively the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Ankheperu Ray, the son of Ray, Smenkar Ray, um, Jesa Keperu, um, accompanied by the great royal wife, Merit Aten. So not um, Akhenaten and Nefertiti at all, but apparently Pharaoh Smenkare and his wife, Merit Aten, the eldest daughter of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. The fact that this scene appears next to this so-called Durbar scene is, is significant. The, the Durbar scene is, um, is one which occurs in um, at least two uh, of these tombs that I can, I can think of. It's believed to represent uh, real life historical events in the life of Akhenaten and his court. And it represents a gathering of um, high officials from around um, the ancient world, the Egyptian empire and, and beyond, hence the use of this word Durbar. And that event is believed to have taken place around year 12. And the interpretation of uh, Egyptologists is that the decoration of the Durbar scene and this scene of Smenkare and Mary Atom were made at the same time. And that if the Durbar scene dates to year 12 and the decoration um, was inscribed on the wall shortly afterwards, then this scene also relates to year 12, in which case Smenkare was pharaoh of Egypt during the reign of Akhenaten, which makes him what we call a co-regent. So in other words, they were both on the throne at the same time. Um, co-regencies are well attested um, from various points in Egyptian history, of course. We don't always know exactly what the motivations for such things might have been, but it seems likely that either the, the, the pre-existing king himself or those around him um, wanted to ensure the succession of the throne to a favoured candidate rather than leaving it to leaving it more open, waiting for the death of the incumbent king and then um, and, and then passing things on. So you're sort of ensuring smooth transition to the favoured candidate. So Sminkare, it seems, was being lined up as that favoured candidate. We have quite a good amount of evidence from um, the city of Amarna for the existence of Sminkare. So this is the central city here in, in plan. Um, this is the Royal Road running approximately north-south through, uh, through the centre of the city, 
um, where we find some of the most important buildings at Akhenaten's new capital city. This is the Great Art and Temple that Professor Barry Kemp is going to be telling us about um, during the, uh, the study day on 17th of July. Smaller Art and Temple here, which um, some of you may have uh, visited. Um, and in between various um, important um, palace buildings, the so-called King's House here, um, with, we think, a bridge um, connecting it um, across the Royal Road to the Great Palace. And at the south of the Great Palace, there is an extension which has come to be known as the Smenkare Hall because it's built of mud bricks stamped with the cartouches of Smenkare. So the interpretation is that at a certain point, um, Akhenaten adopted Smenkare as a co-regent and he therefore was entitled to a, a big chunk of the, the Great Royal Palace. And so this extension was built um, with bricks um, giving his name. Um, Flinders Petrie uh, also um, found um, a number of um, uh, seal impressions, uh, ring bezel Im impressions bearing the cartouche of um, various royal individuals, but including um, Smenkar Ray, Chesa Keperu. This is the, the, the middle um, section here. So we can see various different um, forms of the name, um, mostly including um, the, uh, the um, coronation name. And Kepri Ray, which we see perhaps most clearly here in number 97 uh, in the centre, and the Ang sign, the Kepa beetle, three plural strokes to make it Keperu rather than just Kepa um, with um, the Ra symbol at the end, and Keperu Ra. And finally, um, as far as evidence um, uh, for Smenkare goes, or evidence we thought was. Um, uh, uh, to be connected with Smenkare. There's this box which turned up in the tomb of Tutankhamun, apparently commemorating um, other members of his royal family, his predecessors perhaps. Um, the box itself is not so useful, but there was a, a strip of wood along the top of it which bears a, a column of inscriptions um, which um, you can see transcribed in the image on the right here, broken into, into three as all together, um, the column seems to record the names and titles of three different people. Um, and, um, and here they are. So the, the longest part of the column is, is the, uh, the section which is on the left hand side here, which includes the familiar name of Nefer Keperu Ra Wa En Ra Akhenaten. So that's Pharaoh Akhenaten. Easy. Um, Let's park the middle column for just a moment. On the right hand side, also fairly easy to interpret, um, the inscription begins the great royal wife, Merit Atten. And we know from the Mary Ra tomb that Mary, Merit Atten was, along with being the daughter of Akhenaten, she was a great royal wife to Smenkare. The name in the middle um, is Ankeperu Re. Get ready, folks. Ankeperu Re, Mary Nefer Keperu Re, Nefer Neferu Atten, Mary Wyan Re. This person is also the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, so king of Upper and Lower Egypt, the lord of the two lands, Ankeperu Ra, um, Meri Nefkeperu Ra, the son of Ra, the lord of the risings, um, uh, Nefer Neferu Aten, um, Meri White Ra. Uh, so this is a pharaoh, no question about it. And of course, you might remember that um, Smenkar Re um, has the coronation name Ankeperu Re and Smenkare was married to Merit Atten. So th this is fairly clearly um, uh, a version of the name Smenkare, right? Um, that's why the box came to be known as the box of Smenkare. Any problem with that is that the name Smenkare itself isn't mentioned here. Okay, well, you know, we know that um, particularly at this period, um, different forms of the name were in use at different times. So perhaps, you know, Smenkare was in use at the time of the Meri Ra tomb, just it had changed here. Okay, fine. But in the 1970s, eagle-eyed Egyptologist, British Egyptologist John Harris noticed that of the two forms of the Ankeperu Re name, so one is Ankeperu Re, Smenkare, Jason Keperu, the other one is the one from the wooden box, Ankeperu Re, Mary Nef Keperu Re, Nef Neferu Atten, Mary Wyan Re. Of those two forms, um, the longer one often features, and this is a tiny, tiny distinction, a T sign, which those of you who know your hieroglyphs will know, is just a little semicircular um, sign. And flat on the bottom and round at the top. 
uh, represents a loaf of bread, folks. Um, it has the phonetic value T, and these signs are used to feminize words. Um, and it appeared following the ank component of the name ankeperu re, making it anket keperu re, which appeared um, to make this a female name. So Harris thought, okay, wow, surprise, Smenkar re is a woman. So who is this woman? Well, it, probably Nefertiti, the most prominent and important woman in the Amarna story, that seems most likely. We also know that Nefertiti, throughout her time as Akhenaten's great royal wife, used this name, Nefer Aten, which also crops up alongside Ankep Rure on the wooden box. So there we go, folks. Um, uh, Smenkare is, is actually Nefertiti. Hang on. A few years later, the German Egyptologist Rolf Krauss proposed that no, there are actually two different Ankepru rays. Um, so two different individuals, both of them using the coronation name Ankepru ray, one of them a woman and one of them a man. Jim Allen extended this idea a few years after that, 1988. He noticed that when the name Nefaneferu Aten was used, it almost always came with an epithet beloved of Akhenaten. But when Nefaneferu Aten is not there, uh, it doesn't. The longer form, uh, moreover, um, uh, of the Ankepru Ray name, that's the Nefenefru Atom one, never accompanied the name Smenkare, as on the wooden box. Meanwhile, Ankepru Ray, Smenkare, uh, Jason Keperu, never occurs alongside the name Nefenefru Atom. So he's confirming Krauss's idea that these are actually two different people. So when we see the name Ankepru Ray, we need to decide which one it is. So here we are again, then this name in the middle, um, which was believed to be that of Smenkare and, and caused this box to, be, to become known as the wooden box of Smenkare, actually may belong to somebody else, somebody female. Lastly, um, in 1998, Marc Gabol, the French Egyptologist, showed that the epithet beloved of Akhenaten so um, Nefekeperu Ray is part of Akhenaten's name. Wa in Ray is part of Akhenaten's name. The, the, um, the short word Meri means beloved of. So Meri Nefekeperu Ray means beloved of Akhenaten. Meri Wa in Ray means beloved of Akhenaten. Gabold showed that that part of the name, beloved of Akhenaten, was in, in fact um, something else earlier. The beloved of Akhenaten part comes later. It was originally effective for her husband. So that confirms um, that this individual is, is a woman with a husband. That husband is Akhenaten. So who is the woman? Well, the most obvious candidate is, of course, Nefertiti. Um, intriguingly enough, the tomb of Tutankhamun, which on the face of it is a very straightforward open and shut case of a tomb of an individual stuffed full of burial equipment made for that person, actually gives us lots and lots of information for the existence of this Ankeperu Re Nefeneferu Aten, apparently a female pharaoh. Um, for a long time, people have noticed that some of the objects in the tomb, which ought to depict um, Tutankhamun himself, the boy king, have rather suspiciously feminine looking features. So a monar art breaks all the rules, breaks all the conventions. And indeed we see Akhenaten himself, statues of unambiguously Akhenaten with quite bulbous hips, for example, and other characteristics which we might normally associate with images of women in Egyptian art. But still figures like this one, this is one of the so-called ritual figures, apparently showing Tutankhamun, it's certainly a pharaoh wearing the white crown with a Uraeus cobra at the front, and if there's a pharaoh depicted in the tomb, you've got to think it's Tutankhamun. But it does seem to have rather sort of bulbous hips and also a, um, a suspiciously prominent pair of breasts here, right? Um, that seems slightly out of keeping with the idea that this is the boy king. The canopic jar stoppers also seem to have um, rather feminine features. Tutankhamun's portrait is one of a, a sort of boyish, good-looking young chap, but this is not that portrait, and it, it, it's an image that's rather feminine. This is a very sort of inexact science, of course, and it, we, we should be wary of trying to make firm identifications just based on female, on, on facial features, 
but um, but still, you know, there are some intriguing sort of problems here. The coffinet, um, which incidentally went underneath the uh, the canopic jar stoppers, so Tuhan Kamun has a very beautiful calcite canopic chest with um, four cylindrical em emplacements within it, topped with stoppers like this. So if you lift a stopper off inside the um, cylindrical emplacement, you'd find one of these, a little miniature coffin, each of which contained the mummified internal organs of Tutankhamun. These also, it's been argued, have faces which um, are not that of Tutankhamun. That might just be down to the art. Um, but in fact, in this case, we know that the inscriptions were redone as well. So they all bear the name of Tutankhamun, but they originally had a different name there. Um, and in fact, even, uh, even some of the, the most important um, objects in the tomb, uh, or at least one of the um, assemblage of coffins, um, appears to have the wrong face as well. So Tutankhamun does have a recognisable portrait, and we see that very well in the death mask. This is that um, slightly sort of chubby cheeked, um, youthful, uh, good looking boy. And although this photograph doesn't show it very well, the innermost solid gold coffin has the same portrait. The outermost one does too. The middle coffin though, just doesn't really look the same. Um, uh, could it have been made for somebody else? Um, one of the clearest examples of Tutankhamun's burial equipment having originally been made for somebody else, inscribed for somebody else, are these mummy bands. And you may have heard me speak about these um, before. They are um, among a number of items in the tomb which, which can be clearly demonstrated to have been re-inscribed for Tutankhamun, having originally had somebody else's name on them. Um, and I was shown these um, during the making of a film a few years ago, and I was expecting to see basically the name of Tutankhamun, but maybe with some sort of telltale marks that suggested that there was originally something else there. So what we're looking at in the image on the left-hand side here is the, the, the topmost part of the um, the upper surface of, of the, the mummy bands, which were placed on the mummy, one running down the length of the body and others in a horizontal direction, as you can see in the, the photo in the centre. What I hadn't realised is that actually what was really significant is what's on the underneath, um, which seems to have been the part that was inscribed earlier. And here we see a completely different uh, inscription with a series of um, actually blank cartouches here and here and here, for example, but then one on the left hand side, which you see just blown up a little bit here, which has still got all of its inscriptions in. And rather than being and Tutankhamun's name, as I say, but with, you know, with some suspicious looking um, traces of an earlier name, it is just somebody else's name. And uh, it's not exactly easy to see, but once you've got your eye in, it is quite clearly the name Ankheperu Ray Meri Nefer. Keperu Ray, and Keperu Ray, beloved of Akhenaten, and that is our Nefer Atom, the female pharaoh. So here we are, the mummy bands at least were certainly made for this person, um, along with quite probably um, rather a lot of the rest of the burial equipment. Nicholas Reeves has speculated that it may be as much as 80% of the burial equipment of Tutankhamun that was originally made for somebody else, specifically Ankeperu Ray, Mary Nefekeperu Ray. It is possible, and this is again a hypothesis of Dr. Reeves, that the death mask itself may originally have been made for somebody else. Tutankhamun's name only crops up once on the, uh, on the death mask in the form of his um, coronation name, his, his pre-name in Nebkeperu Ra, which we see here in this photograph. Dr. Reeves and others believe that there are these telltale signs, you might just about be able to see traces here and there of a, a, an earlier name having been present, and they have restored it as follows. So the green um, part of the drawing shows the cartouche as it is at present, the red parts are the earlier traces, and they can be restored as per the yellow part of the drawing down here, um, as the name Ankeperu Ray, Mary Nefkeperu Ray, the same female pharaoh again. So who was this Ankeperu Ray, Nefeneferu Atom? That's the great question. There are a number of candidates, Nefertiti, of course, um, but there are others, um, Kia, Merit Aten, um, other royal daughters. Nefertiti, in many ways, is the most obvious candidate. She was very prominent throughout Akhenaten's reign, of course. Um, there is a certain amount, well, there's rather a lot of evidence, particularly from the early parts of the reign, um, but throughout, 
that um, as great royal wife, she occupied a more prominent position in the iconography and perhaps in, in everything um, during the Amarna period than any great royal wife before or um, since. And um, some images of Nefertiti show her um, adopting the pose and engaged in activities which previously were reserved for the king. So this is a very good example. It's um, maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this is one of the blocks that came from the very um, early Amarna period temples at Karnak before the move to um, Amarna. And this shows several images of Nefertiti, a repeating image. We'd probably see it best here. This is the figure of Nefertiti. Her head is here. Um, this is uh, this is an upper arm, lower arm, holding a short sword a, or a curved kind of dagger of some kind. And in her other uh, in her other hand, the end of an arm here, although you can't make it out very well, she is. This is a clearly recognisable pose. She's holding the hair of at least one. Um, captive and she is about to bring this short sword down uh, on their on their heads so this is the famous smiting scene which is reserved for pharaoh the very well established scene from the big, the big very earliest period in egyptian history but it's something that this is something that pharaoh is involved in and even though nefertiti is a great royal wife this is not a point at which um, there's any absence of any other pharaoh this is absolutely um, the early part of Akhenaten's reign, but Nefertiti appears to be perhaps on a level with him at this point. So she's very, very prominent um, throughout this time. For um, a long time, it was thought that there was no way that Nefertiti could have succeeded Akhenaten as pharaoh because it was believed that she had, she had disappeared. She'd fallen out of favour or she had perhaps died before Akhenaten did. And that's basically because it seemed as though evidence um, of her from the later part of Akhenaten's reign just didn't exist. But it's uh, the clinching evidence um, certainly has now come to light. Um, not very long ago, um, a uh, Belgian mission working in the area north of Amarna, specifically at the site of their Abu Hinis in a quarry, discovered a short inscription in ink, a kind of um, graffito, Again, not a very long or elaborate text, particularly, but it contains two key elements. One is mention of the great royal wife, his beloved mistress of the two lands, Nefer Neferu Aten Nefertiti. No question who this is. The other crucial element is a date, and it's a date of year 16 in the reign of Akhenaten. And as you'll remember, he died in his 17th year. So this is right at the very end of his reign. And yet Nefertiti is absolutely here. She had not disappeared. She hasn't fallen from favor. Um, she hasn't died, she's still around. And so that idea that it's impossible she could have succeeded him disappears. It is very possible. Um, she also, of course, used the name Nefer Aten um, throughout. Um, and you see that name enclosed in the cartouche uh, here, uh, intriguingly also, um, beneath the, uh, the title Mistress of the Two Lands. Again, that's a sort of feminised version of one of the titles that um, was generally reserved for the king, Nebtawi. Kia, nonetheless, perhaps for some people, remains a, a candidate. She was a, the second wife of uh, Akhenaten, the, the one of uh, only two official wives we know him to have had. She has this unique title, Greatly Beloved Wife of Akhenaten. <laughs> But she does, there is good evidence for this, seem to have fallen out of favour at around about year 11. At this point, um, her, the inscriptions um, which associate her with the North Palace and the Maru Aten, another residential building at Amarna, um, appear to be replaced by inscriptions of Merit Aten, a little bit as though the, uh, those buildings, those important um, palace buildings were being reassigned from Kia um, to Merit Aten. Um, her burial equipment also seems to have been um, reused, reappropriated. So presumably burial equipment was being created for her at a time when um, she was um, uh, occupied a prominent position with the royal family. But then if we're right in thinking that she seems to have fallen out of favour, um, fallen down the pecking order for, for whatever reason, um, it was then decided that her burial equipment could be used for somebody else. And in, indeed, it clearly was, as we will see later on. Merit Aten is another very prominent um, 
female member of the royal family. Um, she um, is very prominent from very early on in Akhenaten's reign. She appears in one of the Karnak temples, the Hoot Ben Ben, alongside Nefertiti. She was also, as we'll see, um, to be buried alongside Akhenaten and Nefertiti in the royal tomb at Amarna. And it is Mary Aten, of course, who seems to have replaced Kiar in these important buildings um, at Amarna. So where Kiar's star was on the wane um, from the, the middle period of, of Akhenaten's reign, Merit Athens was on the rise. And of course, we also know that she was elevated to the status of great royal wife of Smenkare. So she's clearly important uh, too. Um, however, um, I think we can discount Merit Aten on the basis that her name appears alongside that of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Ankeperu Re, Meri Nefkeperu Re, Nefeneferu Aten. Um, I don't, I don't think we can see um, this, uh, the cartouche of Merit Aten, as all being a part of um, this, the the name of one individual. I think we've got three different different people here. And if that's right, then Mary Aten cannot be the same as Ankeperu Re, Nefeneferu Aten. Having said that, there are still people that argue that Mary Aten is indeed this female pharaoh. But um, I, for me, this, this makes it clear that she's not. There are other daughters. Um, Mekit Aten is the second um, of Akhenaten's daughters, but we know she died during his reign, again, as we will see. Um, Ankhsen Pa Aten, who became Ankhsen Amun, um, married to Duncan Moon. We don't have every last um, uh, information for every last detail of her life or, or what happened to her, not by any means. Um, but she, she became the great royal wife of Duncan Moon. And there's not a shred of evidence um, that she is female Pharaoh Nefeneferu Aten. So it seems you, you have to really squint hard and um, take a few liberties with the evidence, I think, to, to interpret her as, as our candidate. There are other daughters. Um, there is even a daughter, Nefenefru Aten, Nefenefru Aten Tosheri, the, the child, um, Nefenefru Aten Jr., to distinguish uh, her from Nefertiti. Um, the similarity of the name is the only reason for associating uh, her with, uh, with, with Pharaoh Nefenefru Aten. There are other daughters, Nefeneferu Rei, um, Setepenre. There's even the possibility that there were one or two or possibly even more daughters about whom we have very little evidence, however. Um, and indeed, there's no reason really to associate any of these with the pharaoh. So for my money, um, we, we need to go back to the first and most obvious candidate. I think Nefeneferu Aten Nefertiti um, became pharaoh and Keperu Rei Nefeneferu Aten, effective for her husband, Akhenaten. So, tombs. Next question is, is, is where were they all buried? We've already seen that a lot of the evidence for these individuals comes from tombs. And yet there's still a lot of question marks over where each of them came to rest. And also um, whether there is going to be more to find. Um, as uh, part of Akhenaten's great um, building projects, the construction of a brand new capital city on virgin soil in Middle Egypt in the region of the um, modern city of Malawi in the Minya province in Middle Egypt. New capital city at, um, at Amarna. Akhenaten um, inscribed um, on a series of rock, natural rock surfaces in a great ring around the territory on which he was going to build uh, his city. Um, inscriptions which, which um, we now call the boundary stealer inscriptions. These are boundary stealy. This is boundary stealer um, B. Um, and they take the form of these great rock cut um, stele. So what the ancients did was they, they sort of cut into the rock an approximately flat rectangular uh, surface, if you like, a rectangular sort of niche with a stealer shape, round topped stealer shape in the center with an image of Akhenaten, in this case, wearing the red crown, Nefertiti behind him, the Aten in the center with its, with its rays uh, coming down here. And then um, two thirds of the, the stealer, the lower two thirds occupied by a long hieroglyphic inscription. Either side of the stealer, um, we have statues of um, Akhenaten uh, on, I think it's Akhenaten on this side, um, Nefertiti and uh, Merit Aten uh, on the other. 
and as part of this, the, this, the inscriptions sort of are explaining what Akhenaten is doing. You know, he, he marks out this territory onto which he's going to build his new city um, for the glorification of the Aten, etc. And as part of his great plan, he's going to build himself a tomb. He says, let a tomb be made for me in the eastern mountain of Akhenaten, and the horizon of the Aten, the, the name of his new city. Let my burial be made in it, in the millions of jubilees which the Aten, my father, has decreed for me. Let the burial of the great king's wife, Nefertiti, be made in it, in the millions of years which the Aten, my father, decreed for her. Let the burial of the king's daughter, Merit Aten, be made in it, in these millions of years. A typically long-winded Egyptian way of saying, I'm going to build a tomb, I'm going to put me in it, my wife and my daughter. Great. So this is um, Amana. A swig of cold coffee. Um, this is uh, the site of Amana, um, Google Earth uh, image, one I've, <laughs> one I've recycled um, several occasions. I think that's probably time I updated my um, my Google Earth image. This is the um, this is the River Nile uh, here. So this is obviously showing the modern uh, the modern landscape. Uh, cultivated land either side. The cultivated land on the on the west bank of the river in this part of the country much much uh, wider than it is on the east. Um, and um, this is a modern image and lots of um, desert has been reclaimed, particularly in the south here. But in general terms, this is not so different from how things would have been in, um, in, uh, in ancient times. Cultivated land um, along the east bank with the city of Amana built along the edge of it in the desert uh, here in this um, kind of area. And the desert plain itself is framed by this very spectacular arc of um, cliffs um, which take you from the low desert plain to the high desert um, wadis here. And Akhenaten says in his inscription about his tomb that it will be constructed in the eastern mountain. And in fact, he built it in this wadi, leading off from a great break in the cliffs um, to the east of the city, snaking off into the distance um, uh, for a few kilometers away from the from the edge of the cliffs here a very spectacular journey some of you may have made it i expect um to to the royal tomb and and, and in citing his tomb in a in a distant desert wadi like this cutting a tomb into the rock he was very much following the model of the valley of the kings of course um the wadi looks uh, looks a little bit a bit like this this is actually i think a little bit further up the um particular wadi branch that the royal tomb is in but just to give you an idea of the landscape very lunar sort of uh landscape the tomb itself in terms of the architecture also more or less follows the model established by uh the new kingdom royal tombs in in the valley of the kings they are essentially by this point um linear um or it's a, either a sort of corridor um type arrangement a corridor of particular grand dimensions um, broken by um, intersections so we have a sloping passageway staircase and uh, as you'll see here from the uh, plan a sta sorry, staircase entranceway sloping passageway another staircase a well which was a, a well-established feature of, um, of, of rural tombs by this point and on the other side of this deep uh, well, we have a, a burial chamber. Um, in the case of the royal tomb, there are two secondary suites of rooms leading off to the right as you enter the tomb. So you enter in this direction, and there's a suite of rooms leading off uh, here, um, leading to an unfinished chamber, which um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the authors of this drawing, this is in fact Barry Kemp and the Amana project, suggests would originally have had the same dimensions as the main burial chamber. And then a smaller suite of rooms comprising three chambers labelled Alpha, Beta and Gamma by Egyptologists here. This is the main burial chamber. You might have noticed in the plan that rather unusually it is asymmetrical. It's sort of square in shape and there are two square base pillars over on one side, but where you might expect square base pillars um, on the left as we look at this um, diagram, there is an open space um, and in fact there is a low plinth as it says here in the label, um, this was for Akhenaten's sarcophagus. And that plinth is exposed here, of course this is a modern wooden floor which has been installed to protect the ancient um, surface. This is the area of that um, supposed sarcophagus plinth. Um, so that seems to have, have lent the room a kind of asymmetry, which feels a bit unfamiliar uh, for Egyptian architecture. 
Um, this is what remains of the burial chamber uh, at the end of the larger of the two secondary suites um, of rooms. There's not really very much to see. Um, it was clearly not, um, not finished. Um, the obvious conclusion, by the way, in case you haven't already got there, is um, to following Arkhanatan's boundary steel inscription, that the main axis terminating in the main burial chamber was indeed intended for Akhenaten, and the two subsidiary sets of rooms were intended for Nefertiti and Mary Aten. And the other people, he tells us, would be buried in his tomb. So Akhenaten died in his 17th year, and presumably he was buried in his tomb. Right, that would be the um, the obvious um, first point of departure, for the obvious conclusion to draw straight away. Um, we do, in fact, have at least bits of um, Akhenaten's um, sarcophagus. They were found um, in the tomb um, in very small pieces. They've been reassembled um, and um, the, the basic shape of the sarcophagus box restored. And you can see this um, in the uh, in the sculpture garden. Um, around the outside of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's, it's on your left as you exit um, the museum, having left the gift shop. So it's kind of an afterthought, uh, really, in the way it's displayed at the museum, which seems a shame for something potentially so important. Um, as I say, I mean, it's in bits, but you can probably make out the uh, high relief um, art and sun disc here with its, um, with its rays reaching down and fragments of cartouches of, um, of the art and and Arkhenaten uh, as well. No doubt that this was his sarcophagus. Um, this shouldn't be taken as proof that he was buried in the tomb. This is probably the, the kind of thing that would have been prepared and probably introduced to the tomb prior to the body itself, quite possibly prior to the death. Um, so we shouldn't take this to mean that he was buried there. Um, but we have no reason to think that having died, um, pre presumably had a mana, as far as our evidence goes, that he, he wasn't indeed buried in the tomb um, he intended to be buried in. However, there is evidence that Akhenaten's plan for the tomb had to be changed. The best evidence for that comes from room gamma in this, um, the smaller of the two uh, secondary suites of rooms. And what we're looking at here is an image of an individual here on the left inside a shrine, uh, indicating uh, that this is a deceased individual. And before the shrine, we have a, uh, a large figure here, Beneath the Aten um, sun disk, this is Akhenaten, of course, followed by slightly smaller um, Nefertiti. And then, although only two uh, the figures are visible here, there are, in fact, as we know from the label text, three further figures slown, shown at slightly smaller scale. These are three of Akhenaten's daughters, um, Merit Aten, Aksempa Aten, who would go on to become Tutankhamun's wife, and Nefenefru Aten Tarsherit. The figure inside the shrine is clearly identified by the label text as Meket Aten, the second daughter of Akhenaten. So it seems, um, the implication of this scene is, is fairly clear, Meket Aten had died unexpectedly, we assume, at a young age, um, and she is here being mourned um, by the rest of her family. And the presence of this scene in this part of the tomb strongly suggests that she was buried in this place. So the tomb, it seems, had to have been adapted because of the unexpected early death of Akhenaten's second daughter, a tragedy for the family. The burial chamber decoration is really not very well preserved at all. There's very, very little left and, and um, without specialist equipment and specialist expertise, it's very difficult to make anything out at all. But um, Jeffrey Martin, who's responsible for the um, definitive publication of the decoration in the tomb, um, the Royal Tomb at Elamana, Volume 2 is the one you need, published by the Egypt Exploration Society. Um, he reconstructed the scene on the left-hand wall as you enter the burial chamber um, as, uh, as here. What we're looking at is something actually rather similar to the Meket Aten scene. So we have the Aten sun disk in the center here, sun's rays. Um, we have the largest figure here on the right, more or less in the same position occupied by Akhenaten in the Meket Aten scene. And again, this is indeed Akhenaten. There are traces of a second figure behind him. Um, we would guess it to be Nefertiti, and indeed that seems to be confirmed by um, the tiny traces of her unique flat-topped crown. And then there are further figures behind, shown slightly higher in the register, but at smaller scale. And again, we would assume these are the daughters. 
There is also apparently on the left hand side in the same position as the Mekit Aten shrine, a shrine, in this case topped with a frieze of Uraeus cobras with sun discs uh, on their heads and a figure inside it here, not very well preserved at all, but various elements of what is preserved have suggested to Egyptologists that this has to be a full queen uh, and a great royal wife, in fact. And as Nefertiti is herself present, there's only one other candidate in the Amarna story for a great royal wife um, who, who this might be, and that is Queen T, um, the mother of Akhenaten, the wife of Amenhotep III, who we know survived her husband, made the journey to El Amarna, and was a part of the royal court for a number of years during Akhenaten's time there. So um, it seems from this scene that Queen T was also buried in the royal tomb in the main burial chamber. And that perhaps explains the asymmetry. Um, the burial chamber had to be adapted to receive not only the burial of Akhenaten, but of his mother, Queen T, as well. There are actually other tombs in the royal wadi, given the numbers 27, 28 and 29. None of them is completely finished, none of them is decorated, and next to nothing has been found in any of them, so it's very difficult for us to, um, to be clear about who they were intended for, um, but in any case it seems um, pretty much impossible to imagine that any of them was really used. And 27 is, uh, is unfinished, features a single corridor with access via a staircase, Central ramps in 26, which is the main royal tomb, the dimensions are similar. So this looks like another royal tomb. Could that have been for Pharaoh uh, Smenkare, perhaps? Who knows? 28 is smaller, finished, but undecorated. The entrance corridor and, uh, and it has an entrance corridor and three chambers, um, which make it look like the smaller of the two subsidiary sets of rooms in the, the main royal tomb. Could these have been for royal daughters, perhaps? That seems a good, uh, a good uh, stab. 29 uh, has four corridors which were cut and plastered, so th this had um, achieved a um, a good, uh, a, a good distance along the road towards completion, but no other chambers. Dimensions were similar to the larger of the two subsidiary sets of rooms, so possibly for a lesser queen. We might speculate that this was for Kia or possibly Mary Atten, who would have been elevated by this status beyond, by, by this point beyond the status of simply royal daughter. We might conclude, just on the basis of what we have in the royal wadi, that Akhenaten was buried in the royal tomb. We've already seen that. Um, we know, or we, can, we think we can be sure now that T was buried there. Um, we think that Mekhet Atom was buried there. And we do have, you know, uh, enough other, other monuments to suggest that the clear intention was that for all the royal family members, as you'd expect to be buried in Amarna. Um, we don't know where they, were, where they were buried, but the assumption might have been that they, they were all accommodated in the royal tomb, perhaps. Um, we, we can't be sure. In any case, in uh, 1908, I think, um, a discovery was made in the Valley of the Kings, um, which made the picture much more complicated and um, much more interesting, perhaps, for us. This is the discovery of the 55th tomb in the Valley of the Kings by the British uh, archaeologist Edward Ayrton, who, who was sponsored by the American lawyer and scoundrel Theodore Davis. Um, the excavations were... Uh, not conducted to the very high standards that we might expect of an archaeological excavation today. Um, what documentation we have amounts to a number of haunting photographs like this one and the descriptions of Ayrton and Davis and one or two others who contributed to the report that was published soon afterwards. And of course, we have the original material uh, itself, who was in a very bad state. Um, it is a very um, uh, simple um, design the tomb. It's essentially an entrance um, corridor terminating in a single square chamber um, with a, a, a rather large niche, but otherwise it's not more complicated than that. But it was full, as you can see, we're looking from the burial chamber outwards towards the sunlight here. The entrance corridor was partially filled um, with a lot of, of debris um, consisting of some quite large chunks of the natural rock but also much smaller um, chippings and dust probably brought in um, as a result of a, a flash flood, perhaps. 
and mixed in amongst um, all of this, um, the remains of um, some burial equipment and other cultural material. Um, I seem to remember. I should have. Um, I should have written a, uh, put up a quote here. But in his um, report, Ayrton describes the crunch of antiquities underfoot um, as he and his colleagues um, entered the tomb for the first time by by lamplight. Very very hazardous um, situation when you think about how fragile this material was, and also what might have been lost in the very moment of the tomb's uh, discovery. This is a reconstruction drawing from the 1990s. I'm sorry I didn't put an attribution up here, but I think it's from um, Lila Pinchbrock's um, article um, uh, uh, reconstructing uh, what happened. There were a number of um, articles along these lines published in, in the 1990s um, because the original excavation report is, um, is so lacking. Uh, in detail. So this isometric drawing shows the situation as, as I say, I think it's Lila Pinchbrock reconstructed it based on photographs, descriptions, etc. So we have um, a very steeply descending staircase leading down to uh, um, an intersection um, doorway, um, leading then to a descending passageway, which as you can see from the drawing here perhaps, um, is partially filled with debris um, and some of that debris, or a lot of that debris, has then spilled into the burial chamber. Lying on top of the debris, curiously enough, we have uh, some cultural material in the corridor and also in the burial chamber. Among the first things that the excavators saw were these very large wooden panels. One of them here, and two further panels lying, um, leaning up against the wall. There's another one here. These were gilded wooden panels um, into which uh, had been um, created uh, scenes of a, a very beautiful scene of a queen in, in this case. It's clearly an Amana scene. We can see the rays of the Aten sun disk with these characteristic hands reaching towards the beautiful profile of a queen who in fact has very much the features that of a sort of Amenhotep III era individual. And um, this particular panel, um, which is probably uh, bears the best of the decoration, doesn't actually have the necessary inscriptions we need to identify this person, but others of the panel did, and they make it very clear that this, um, these panels came from some kind of a shrine belonging to Queen T. As we've already seen, Queen T, we thought, was buried in the royal tomb at Amarna. So what's this stuff doing turning up in a valley of the king's tomb? Um, Queen T, as we've already said, was uh, she outlived her husband, Amenhotep III. She made the journey to Amarna and she continued to be a very prominent uh, part of the story of the royal family in Amarna, as we know from a number of tomb scenes and other evidence. And she also occupied a very prominent position uh, alongside Amenhotep III, not prominent to the same extent as Nefertiti's uh, was alongside Akhenaten, but nonetheless she was a very influential and important individual. The panels themselves, although uh, shrines like this one, which come from the tomb of Tutankhamun, hadn't been discovered at this point, it's clear we, retrospectively they are, they are panels from something similar. So these shrines were the ones erected in the tomb of Tutankhamun around the sarcophagus. So it looks as though the panels from KV55 are a, a similar shrine that would originally have surrounded the sarcophagus of the queen, or intended for that anyway. The best known uh, artifact discovered in KV55, of course, um, was this coffin um, placed um, without full ceremony, not inside a sarcophagus, but nonetheless placed apparently with some care and precision um, aligned um, with the walls of the burial chamber over to the right hand side as you enter. It was in an extremely fragile condition, made of wood, um, gilded wood with um, inlays of various different precious materials. Much of the wood itself had rotted away. So what you see here is the form of the coffin, um, but in an extremely fragile uh, state. And it was found that the coffin contained the mummy of an individual. Um, Davis um, initially announced um, without any hesitation that this must be the body of Queen T. We have already got inscriptions of Queen T in her shrine. Um, there was nothing uh, on the coffin to indicate immediately that, um, that it belonged to anybody else. So uh, this was, um, as far as um, Davis was concerned, the body of Queen T and indeed the tomb of Queen T. However, 
And not very long afterwards, the, the human remains were studied by um, anatomists, and it was very clear to them from the off uh, that this was not the body of Queen T. It couldn't be because it's the body of a male individual. So we've got material of Queen T, but the body of a man in the tomb. The coffin itself, um, sadly, doesn't provide us with um, the, uh, the evidence we need to identify this individual. The face is missing. As you will see, it would have been a, um, a, a, um, a, a, a gilded golden face um, stripped away unceremoniously here. Um, and the cartouche, as you can probably see, um, which would have um, appeared approximately midway down the central column of inscriptions on the front of the coffin, has been very carefully removed as well. It is clear that this uh, was the coffin of uh, a pharaoh. Um, we can tell that, of course, from the uraeus here, from the divine beard, and also from the inscriptions, um, which uh, are those of, of a king. Cartouche um, uh, hints at that, but the clincher is the, the preceding titles, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, Lord of the Two Lands. It seems actually as though this was the coffin of a woman. We can tell that from the headdress, and it seems that this was subsequently, it, wasn't, it was the coffin of a, of a woman who was not Pharaoh and readapted. The uraeus and the beard are later additions um, for a male, and the inscriptions were presumably redone at this point as well. Intriguingly, although the cartouche itself is missing, the epithet that follows it um, may in fact be the giveaway. Um, the epithet reads, um, Par Sheri Nefer uh, En Par Artem, the beautiful child of the Artem, which is an epithet which um, belonged to Akhenaten. Some Canopic jars were found in the tomb as well, um, on, uh, in a niche at the side of the burial chamber. There were four of them. Um, sadly, the, uh, the group was split up. So one of them is now in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. The other three remained in Egypt in the National Collection. Um, this is how they were displayed, uh, possibly still are, I'm not sure, um, in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, very beautiful. Um, and it seems from the headdress, which is not quite unique perhaps, but very distinctive, uh, a, very, a very distinctive part of the um, uh, image of Kia, Akhenaten's uh, second wife, um, that these were indeed made for her. And in fact, this is the same headdress pretty much. Uh, that we see on the coffin. So the conclusion is that this was the coffin and the canopic jars of Kia recycled cartouche for Pharaoh, uh, so, so the coffin for Pharaoh, but also the canopic jars for Pharaoh as well. You might just about be able to make out these um, little sockets which have been created at the brow, which would have been used to, to receive, we assume, a uraeus. Um, the inscriptions are, are, are no longer present, so we don't have those to rely on, um, but that, that's the interpretation. Finally, placed very carefully around the coffin, around the sides, these magical bricks, and these are unambiguously um, bricks of Akhenaten. Um, his is the name that appears on them. Um, uh, these are a, a, a crucial part of the, the, the burial assemblage for, um, for royals from this time. So again, although uh, the burial of this individual in KV 55 was, was not undertaken with full ceremony. You know, think of the situation in, in the tomb of Tutankhamun where you have the mummy with goodness only knows how many objects on it and a death mask and three coffins inside a sarcophagus, inside four shrines. All we've got here is a mummy inside a coffin um, and with the magical bricks placed around it. But it was done with some care. These weren't dumped. Um, uh, so this, you know, this nonetheless was a formal burial. It's not just a, a, a sort of a case of material being chucked away into a corner. The, the mummy um, turned out to be the remains of an individual who was approximately 20 years old. And these human remains have been studied on a number of occasions since they were discovered. I think it's about six or seven times now. They've been thoroughly studied by different uh, teams of anatomists and they all conclude the same thing, which is that this individual was around about 20. And that ought to rule out Akhenaten as a candidate. We know that he ruled into his 17th year. And if he died when he was 20, he must have come to the throne at age three. And let's not forget that he began his revolution pretty much immediately. Um, so this just isn't 
plausible. Akhenaten must have been older than 20 when he died, in which case he cannot be the mummy in KV 55. And yet all the evidence, the inscription on the front of the coffin um, and the magical bricks in, in particular, all point to this being Akhenaten. The next um, discovery we should consider was actually made a few years before um, KV 55, which is the 35th tomb to be found in the Valley of the Kings. Um, the tomb of Amenhotep II, the discovery was made by Victor Lore, fresh from the triumph of discovering the tomb of Thutmose III, KV 34. Um, it, 35 is a very beautifully decorated tomb, Amenhotep II, Akhenaten's great-grandfather was an important uh, individual um, in the New Kingdom, of course. This would have been a, a great discovery enough, um, were it not also for the fact that uh, the tomb uh, contained in two side chambers leading off the main um, burial compartment of a cache of New Kingdom pharaohs to add to the royal cache discovered by the Abdur Rasul brothers a few years before, and then in, a, in another side room, this extraordinary site, three unwrapped mummies, mummified individuals unwrapped, lying side by side on the ground, associated with no cultural material at all. So apparently placed here on the one hand, you know, with some care, but also far from um, uh, having been given a, a, a proper burial, uh, at, at, least, at least by this point. Um, the individual in the centre is um, was a young male, and the individuals either side, both female, one demonstrably older than the other. Hence, without anything better to go on, the labels the younger lady and the elder lady. Um, and the one on the right, which we see here, is the elder lady. Um, for my money, um, one of the most um, beguiling uh, of the mummies that we have from ancient Egypt. For the state of preservation and in particular for this um, incredible um, hair that's been so beautifully preserved. We can now identify um, this lady um, many years later in uh, the 1980s, um, I think it was, a lock of hair discovered in the tomb of Tutankhamun uh, was, uh, was studied. Um, this comes from a miniature coffin found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, given the, the, um, the Carter accession number 320D, and it contained the locks of hair in question, the, the locks of hair which we see in the photo at bottom right here. The miniature coffin itself was inscribed with the name of Queen T, and the study in the 1980s that showed, showed that this hair was biologically a match for the hair on the KB35, uh, so the KB35 um, elder lady. So on that basis, we identify the elder lady as being Queen T. So again, hang on, we thought she was buried in the Royal Tomb of Amarna. Her shrine turned up in KV 55, and now her body appears to have turned up in KV 35. What's going on? Let's look first at uh, the younger lady. Um, it has been suggested that she might be Nefertiti. Um, Joanne Fletcher, uh, a number of years ago, um, conducted a very thorough examination of the mummy, which showed that the um, the the injuries that we see on on the face here um, could not have been anything to do with the cause of death, um, because they cut through the embalming resin. So, in other words, the mummy had been embalmed, and then this damage was was done, which suggested to Joe that this was an instance of what we call damnatio memoriae, where uh, in this case, the body of the individual is deliberately damaged, desecrated, so as to damn and, and condemn the memory of the individual to eternal damnation, um, because this was somebody that was not liked. And we know, of course, that the Amarna royals, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun and co, uh, I also were deliberately removed from the records um, not long after uh, the Amarna period, certainly by the beginning of the um, uh, or the early 19th dynasty in the reigns of Seti I and Ramesses II, their great king lists do not include the names of these people, showing very clearly that there was a deliberate attempt to forget them. So something like Damnatio Memoriae, um, and you know we see this in the, um, the removal, the de demolition of Akhenaten's monuments, removal of his name from here and there, um, that, um, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that was perhaps happening. However, 
The recent DNA study of uh, these mummies and the other royal mummies discovered in various places um, in the Theban necropolis has perhaps made it unlikely that Joe's um, conclusion that um, the uh, younger lady is Nefertiti um, uh, on the following bases. Well, this is this is uh, this is the situation. This is what we know. Well, this is what's pertinent to our discussion here. The DNA study shows that um, the KV55 mummy, this mummy of a male of about 20 years old, was the father of the mummy discovered in the tomb of Tutankhamun, which we've no reason to think is anybody other than Tutankhamun himself. So the KV55 mummy is the father of Tutankhamun. The younger lady, whoever she might be, was the mother of Tutankhamun. They were both children of Amenhotep III, whose mummy uh, has been identified in um, uh, the royal caches, and T, who of course we know is the elder lady. So Tutankhamun's parents were full brother and sister, um, at least according to the initial results of the analysis. This, um, we think, makes it very unlikely that the younger lady is either Nefertiti or Kia, because despite the fact that we have um, abundant evidence for both, particularly for Nefertiti, um, neither of them ever mentions being either a king's sister, i.e. sister of Akhenaten, or a king's daughter, daughter of Amenhotep III, which you would expect. This would be a strange omission. We still don't know who either of these individuals are. However, the KV-55 mummy is a, a royal male of the Amarna period, and there are only really two candidates. One of them is Akhenaten, the other one is Smenkare. In the case of the younger lady, it seems if it's not Nefertiti or Kia, and it's a, a full daughter of Amenhotep III and T, then it must be a lesser known uh, daughter um, who um, was a lesser queen or consort of some kind of the KV-55 individual. So a lesser, a lesser wife consort uh, of either Akhenaten or Smenkare. Um, but the evidence doesn't really allow us to be firmer in our conclusions than that at the moment. Last question, and I'm aware I'm overrunning, folks. I'm so sorry about that as usual. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, where was Nefer-Neferu Aten buried? Well, actually, there is a, another tomb uh, in the Theban necropolis, not a royal tomb, um, but the tomb of a non-royal individual called Pa'iri, um, uh, tomb of the period of Tuthmosis IV, slash Amenhotep III, a little bit before Akhenaten, which might actually provide us with some, some help in trying to understand where she was buried. Um, it's not actually the decoration of Pa'iris, but a graffito which crops up in the tomb, which is of use. So we have to ignore all this fabulously beautiful decoration um, of uh, Pa'iri himself. And we're looking instead at this much less spectacular, but very useful and interesting um, uh, inscription in ink in the hieratic script. It's a prayer to Ammon. And that's significant, of course, um, for a man called Pawa, who was a priest in the temple of Ankeperu Rei. This is in Thebes, so we assume that the temple of Ankeperu Rei is in Thebes. Ankeperu Rei, you will remember, is a name which belonged both to Smenkare. Pharaoh Smenkare and Pharaoh Nefenefru Atum. So there's a temple of one or the other of those two in this area. If we're right in thinking that Smenkare began his reign during Akhenaten's time, but Nefertiti Nefenefru Atum didn't begin her reign as Pharaoh until after Akhenaten's death, probably more likely um, that the temple of Ankeperu Re in the Thebes is that of Pharaoh Nefenefru Aten. And indeed, that idea is strengthened by the very first part of this inscription, which is a date, uh, date line. And the date is of year three in the reign of, and the, the inscription is, um, is, is partly missing, but it's absolutely clear who it belongs to. It's year three in the reign of Ankeperu Re Meri something, Nefenefru Aten Meri something else clearly Pharaoh Nefenefru Aten. So year th in year three, we have a, a temple, a reference to a temple of Ankeperu Re and a prayer to Ammon. This suggests that Ammon worship is back by this point 
and also that nephinephrine atom is uh, around, recognized, and perhaps active in Thebes. So the transition from Amarna is already at least underway. In that case, it's much more likely that um, her reign came to an end at the point at which um, Thebes was again fully functioning and the Valley of the Kings was too, in which case Pharaoh Nefenevru Atom was probably buried in the Valley of the Kings. This is partly what led to a theory in 2015, which you may be familiar with, that um, there may be further chambers within the tomb of Tutankhamun itself concealed behind what we have thought up to now to be solid rock walls. So this is the burial chamber in the tomb of Tutankhamun where well, we're looking from the antechamber into the burial chamber. You can just about perhaps make out that image of um, Tutankhamun and I performing the ritual of the opening of the mouth, the breathing beyond the uh, sarcophagus there. And a few years ago, um, during the production of a full 3D a uh, full-scale replica of the tomb, um, the Factum Arte team um, made 3D scans of the surface of the walls, which allowed, um, virtually allowed us to, to see the shape of the surface of the walls, which is ostensibly completely flat, but of course isn't in, in reality, it has its own sort of little contours. Um, and when uh, Nicholas Reeves, uh, one of the leading experts on the period and Tutankhamun and all these various issues, looked at this, he began to see what he believed to be features of concealed architecture. So this is the plan of the tomb of Tutankhamun at the moment. You enter um, here um, via a staircase, an entrance corridor. You come into the antechamber where, where Carter first saw his uh, wonderful things. And you take a right hand turn. Uh, towards the burial chamber. My photograph was taken looking like, uh, looking in this direction. So that's what we have at the moment. Nicholas Rees was looking at the three-dimensional surface of this wall, believing he could see a continuation of the tomb uh, in this direction, a little bit as though um, this was not a, a case of an antechamber and a burial chamber, but rather a corridor continuing like this. Um, so this isometric drawing shows what um, Nicholas Rees believed um, believes uh, we should perhaps um, expect to be there and there should be a doorway in what is now the northern wall of the burial chamber of King Tut and a continuation of this corridor and of course false walls crop up in Egyptian tombs quite frequently in royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings um, even so this is the tomb of Tutankhamun itself originally the antechamber um, was separated from the burial chamber by just such a false wall which had to be demolished um, by Carter in order that he could retrieve the material beyond. And we see this elsewhere as well. So this is KV57, the tomb of Horam Heb. Um, we are looking here at a, a modern wooden walkway which allows visitors to cross the deep well shaft to the chambers beyond. If you look closely, you'll see that the decoration on this wall is actually broken. This is an image of um, Horus at the left here. And what would originally have been here was um, a false wall um, across which the decoration continued. Um, the idea being that any would-be robbers who entered the tomb would first of all be foiled by the well, but even if they weren't, they would, they would think that they had reached the end of the tomb when in fact it continues into the rock. Nicholas Reeves believes this is exactly what we're looking at in the north wall uh, of the burial chamber of Tutankhamun. It's a false wall designed to fool people, robbers, but also archaeologists, into thinking that there's nothing more there. And he believes that, you know, beyond this point, um, we would find, in fact, uh, a, a much larger burial chamber um, uh, fitting for the burial of a pharaoh. The burial chamber of Tutankhamun is really too small, of course, and that we would find that this was the burial chamber of Pharaoh Nefertiti. Um, he published this um, theory in a paper which was made freely accessible by his academia page in 2015 and he's since followed this up with um, um, a further paper analysing the decoration on the north wall which he believes shows that originally the figures which are now labelled as Tutankhamun were in fact figures of Nefertiti um, and they were reworked um, to uh, depict Tutankhamun at the point um, Nefertiti's tomb was readapted to receive in haste Tutankhamun's burial. It's a great read. Uh, you may not agree with the conclusions, but uh, I strongly advise you to go and, um, and seek it out because it's, um, it's uh, a great discussion of all the various issues. 
Finally, um, initially prompted by Nicholas Reeves' theory, a number of um, non-invasive surveys have been conducted in the area of the tomb of, the Tutank of Tutankhamun to see if there are any further chambers um, there. The first of these was conducted by um, a Japanese team and they concluded that yes, uh, there was more to find behind the walls in Tutankhamun's tomb. A second um, American-led team concluded that no, there was nothing but solid rock. And a third team, an Italian team, whose results were published in uh, this, this paper, which you see on the screen here, concluded that no, there were no further chambers to be found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. But there is at least one significant anomaly in the area around the tomb of Tutankhamun, which may represent an as yet undiscovered uh, tomb. And it's long been speculated that there might be something else to find in this uh, area of the valley. And I think partly prompted by this, uh, Dr. Zahi, we started the talk with Dr. Zahi, we're finishing with Dr. Zahi, um, has been excavating in the, in, the, in the Valley of the Kings for, um, for a couple of years, or at least he was in, um, I think, 2018, 2019. And towards the end of 2019, uh, he made uh, an announcement um, that an industrial area had been found in what's called here the Valley of the Monkeys, when we sometimes call it uh, the Western Valley. It's a branch of the Valley of the Kings, and it's the location of a number of tombs of approximately the period we've been discussing today. So the tombs of Amenhotep III, the king immediately prior to Akhenaten is to be found there. The tomb of Ai, um, Tutankhamun's successor is also there. And there are a couple of other tombs um, which have been known about for some time, which, are, um, which were cut for unknown individuals or unfinished. Um, one of those it's been suggested was in fact intended for Akhenaten before the great move to um, Amarna. Um, uh, Dr. Zahi, um, of course, very, very good at um, generating excitement around archaeological work, um, uh, was not shy in, in saying that he was hoping that he would find some of the tombs of our missing individuals. He hasn't done that yet, but he, he did find this industrial area and a number of inlays like this and the, the, um, the, the chevron shaped inlays of carnelian and turquoise that you see in the centre here in particular are reminiscent of the chevron shapes that we see in the KV-55 coffin uh, and also um, one of the coffins of Tutankhamun. So they look like um, material that, that come from the right sort of period and Zahi's suggestion is that, that these have been found in this place because they were being used in the production of coffins um, that would then be deposited in tombs nearby. Um, and this, you know, might indicate um, that we have an as yet undiscovered Amarna period tomb in the area. But as I say, it's not been found yet. It has also been suggested by others um, that rather than being evidence of the production of coffins, these might actually um, be in the area as a result of the other end of the process at the end of the New Kingdom when the tombs were um, were were um, were being entered by the authorities so they could remove. Um, the coffins and the mummies of the kings and transfer them to these new secret caches. At the same time, um, a lot of the precious materials from the burial equipment were removed um, so that uh, the, the materials, particularly things like gold, could be recycled. And of course, if you're removing um, gold from gilded coffins like the KV-55 or, or King Tut coffins, you, you wouldn't be able to do that without removing inlays like this. So it's possible that Zahi's interpretation is right, but there are other ideas too. Um, what I didn't do yesterday, but I think I ought to do today um, to try and head off um, questions from bewildered audience members is just a short summary. So we've reviewed the evidence. I don't expect you to agree with the conclusions that I've that I've drawn here. Um, and there's certainly there's certainly lots of room for alternative ex ex explanations. Um, but just to co cover the, the sort of the main things. Smenkare was a co-regent of Akhenaten. I, I, I think that's right, but there are, there are other views. It's still possible he might have succeeded Akhenaten, their reigns didn't overlap. We don't hear anything of him from after Akhenaten's reign, or nothing that we can, we can clearly say comes from after Akhenaten's reign. And um, the view of, of specialists like Aidan Dodson, and I, I follow him in this, um, are that in fact Smenkare was a co-regent and died before Akhenaten. So his reign falls entirely within Akhenaten's. He has no impact on the chronology that way. 
Akhenaten was succeeded by Ankhep Rure Nefenefru Aten, who is in fact Akhenaten's own great royal wife, Nefertiti, effective for her husband. Um, at, possibly at the same point, the same time, possibly during her reign, or possibly only on her death, um, Tutankhamun Aten was crowned pharaoh. He only reigned for a few years, dying in his ninth year, having changed his name to Tutankhamun during that time. The old ways were changing and, and changed uh, finally definitively during Tutankhamun's reign, but it seems likely that they were underway during Nefertiti's. Um, it for, it's for that reason that there's the, the distinct possibility, I think, that Nefenefru Aten and Tutankhamun's reigns overlap at least a little. Um, in terms of the tombs, Akhenaten, sorry, lots of text here, Akhenaten was buried in the royal tomb of Amarna, but his body was then moved to KV-55. In my view, the KV-55 body is Akhenaten. <clears throat> I think on, on the balance of evidence, that's the better interpretation, but it is possible that it's Menkare. Queen T was also buried in the royal tomb initially, but then moved to KV-55 at the same time as Akhenaten was. Her body was then moved to KV-35. Mekit Aten was also buried in the royal tomb at Amarna, but we have no further evidence of her. Um, it was probably intended that Smenkare, Nefenefru Aten, and also the other members of the royal family would be buried in the royal wadi at Amarna. Smenkare probably died there. If he was a co-regent and died before Akhenaten, we think probably he would have been buried there. The extra tombs, the additional tombs in the royal wadi were never finished, so I can't see that any of them could have been used for a burial. In that case, the best option is the royal tomb. Um, but even then, we, we have to imagine a sort of tomb filling up with, with burials. And there's no real evidence that Smenkar Ray was buried there. It's just speculation. Um, we have no evidence of his burial, his burial equipment, really, or his body. Um, Nefertiti, Nefenefru Aten, probably made the journey back to Thebes, as we've seen. And for that reason, I think she was probably buried in the Valley of the Kings, as pharaohs were by that point. Her body and tomb have never been found, unless you believe that her body is one of those anonymous mummies found in KB35 or elsewhere. Much of the burial equipment of hers, as pharaoh and Kepiru Ray, Nefenefru Aten, has been found, but reused in the tomb of Tutankhamun. What that means um, for the tomb, burial, and burial equipment of Nefertiti is a bit unclear. With that, <laughs> um, I, I will finish, um, and, and just with the, with the line that um, this is to be continued, clearly. Um, discussion is going to be continued, no doubt, and um, no doubt new evidence will come to light and new theories as well. Just before um, I, I, um, I let you go, or we move to the, um, the Q&A, I just want to tell you about a couple of things. Um, this is a, um, uh, a repeat, or this is a, this is a sort of revised version of a talk I've given um, in the past a year ago. Um, many of you probably already know that following these talks, I try um, to, to put together soon afterwards um, a page of, of links and a guide to further reading if you want to, to take your interest in any of these issues further. So my, so my work is based on, on, on the things that I mentioned here. And um, because this is a repeat, this page already exists. It's on my website. So if you go to the, um, the lectures section in the website, there's a drop down and you'll find all of the guides um, that I've, I've put together after my talks, including this one there. Um, 17th of July, save the date. Um, there's nothing else for you to do at the moment, but um, uh, I've been asked to, um, to host this study day with Barry Kemp, Anna Stevens, Anna Hodgkinson, and um, the rest of the Amarna team talking about the latest um, research at Amarna itself, um, some of which, of course, is helping us to understand what was really going on there. Um, and there will be an opportunity for you to put your questions to the archaeologists as, as well. Um, uh, and all of the proceeds go to the Amana project. So it's a great cause and I think it's going to be a great event. Um, so do save the date and um, I hope to see you there. And we're going to make sure the capacity for that is, um, is very large because we're expecting, expecting large numbers. So um, that should be a really great event. Um, uh, shameless uh, self-promotion here. We just announced um, AWT and I, Ancient World Tours and I, um, a fifth departure of the, the Missing Tombs trip. This is um, a tour which is based on my uh, searching for the lost tombs uh, of Egypt book. I mention it here particularly because the tomb visits Amarna. We spend a day at Amarna. We will visit the royal tomb. Uh, we'll have a very good look at the Mekit Aten scene and what's left of the Queen T scene. Um, and we also will be visiting the Valley of the Kings and we have special uh, permission 
to enter uh, KV55 as well. So we will be able to see the, the place where the Queen T Shrine, the, the Kiar canopic jars and that enigmatic coffin and mummy were, were found as well. So if you want to go and see those places, KV55 in particular is, um, is, is, is um, impossible to get to normally. And um, this, this is a good way of doing it. Um, I've also put up the, the guide to, to the, um, my last talk, which, some of which is relevant to the things we've been talking about today. So that's also up on the website. Oh, and um, if you've got any young Egyptologists in, in your, your lives, um, I've got a new book coming out uh, for kids as well, King Tutankhamun and Tells All. That's going to be out on the 3rd of June. So there we go. Thanks very much for listening. Sorry to have overrun. Hope you didn't mind. Um, and um, if you've got any questions, uh, let me know. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, so, uh, so here we go. Questions. We've already got questions. I knew there would be questions. Um, um, Chris uh, says, as a biologist, I'm very keen to know the answer. How do you determine the exact dates of the reigns of each pharaoh? I know carbon dating, but it's not that exact. Do you base the dates on hieroglyphs, even then they can't give you exact dates? Yeah, there's a, there's quite a long answer to this, um, Chris. Um, but essentially, Egyptologists like me don't really like what we call absolute dates. So if I'm really honest with you, I can never remember the in years BC when, um, for example, Tutankhamun died. And that's because we can't know that for sure. Uh, the way that we uh, can get close to those absolute year dates BC. The Egyptians didn't don't use any kind of system like you know of that kind that would allow us to um to 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 establish those dates. What we do is we make use of what are called synchronisms with other cultures. So other ancient cultures have um uh, provide evidence which do allow us to to date things um, accurately according to our, our own dating system so you know counting backwards into years bc um the earliest fixed point using synchronisms etc in egyptian history is the accession of the reign of pharaoh Taharko in the 25th dynasty which we are as sure as can be took place in 690 bc so that is a long time uh, after this point, when you think that we are talking about the second half of the 14th century BC here. Um, so in order to achieve these dates, we, we can rely on synchronisms to some extent, but otherwise we use what are called highest regnal dates. So we've mentioned these a couple of times today. The highest regnal date we have for Akhenaten is 17, year 17. The highest regnal date we have for Tutankhamun is um, is is nine, um, and so working backwards from Taharko in six ninety, Taharko was um, preceded by Shabako, and Shabako's highest regnal date, if I remember rightly, is fourteen. So we add fourteen years to six ninety. Shabako was preceded by Shabitko, whose highest regnal date is five. So working, we add then five. And we keep doing this for all the kings we know of in sequence, and we, we add them all up, and eventually we work our way backwards to where we are here. But there are enormous caveats here that, for example, if we were to discover a year 18 of Akhenaten, we'd have to add, it, add a year. If we discovered a year 100 of Akhenaten, then things would move very dramatically. Um, We've now got enough evidence, we've now accumulated enough evidence over, over the years that that sort of thing doesn't change very much now. The other thing is that there are ways of anchoring things. So, for example, um, there we know when things like lunar eclipses took place in history. We know that because astronomers are able to tell us when those things happen. And occasionally we have evidence for Egypt from Egypt, um, which... Um, we we can interpret to mean the Egyptians had witnessed a lunar eclipse. So we can tie that, and if that is a dated inscription, so let's say there's a dated inscription of Ramesses II, year 20, saying, oh, and lo, did the moon appear to go all dark? Then we can say year 20 was the time of a lunar eclipse, and then we just need to pick the, approximately the right one, and then we can line things up. 
but it is very much an inexact science. And um, a few years ago, a laboratory in Oxford took organic samples from various different periods in Egyptian history and subjected them to carbon dating to see if we could refine the system. And you're right that carbon dating is it doesn't doesn't allow us to sort of pin things down to the exact um, year, but it, it can allow us to get quite close. And the carbon dating showed that more or less the system that we had been using or the, the dates that we had been using are pretty much right. And um, we don't, like I say, Egyptologists don't like using absolute dates because we can't be sure they're right. And, and, and when a bit of evidence comes out of the ground, it might cause us to change our dates by a bit here and there. So we try not to use them. It's much better for us to say such and such a thing happened in year 18 of Pharaoh Amenhotep the third, because because that within those limitations is right. I think, however, it is helpful to use absolute dates, as I did at the beginning of the talk, because it gives you guys out there an, an idea of when things took place. So, for example, I think that list um, gave as the date of Amenhotep the third's death, 1353. I'm not going to say that it definitely happened in 1353, but that's approximately, probably approximately right. Long answer, but it's a bit complicated that. Um, I have to talk to in the past about possibly doing a lecture about chronology and things, which I would like to do, but um, um, I, let's just say it's in the queue. <laughs> Thanks for your question anyway, Chris. Um, Ahmed said, where did Carter find the Smenka Ray box? Um, it was in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, Ahmed, I'm not absolutely sure. I'd need to go and check exactly where in the tomb it was found, but, it, but it's, in the, it's in the tomb anyway. Um, if that's something you're dying to know, drop me a line after the talk and I'll look it up for you. Um, but forgive me, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, um, Bex says, KV55 uh, so similar in entry to KB62, is this of any relevance? Yeah, it, it is, Bex, um, in as much as um, uh, various of the, of the features, including the sort of entrance passageway, um, would allow us to hypothesize that um, this is a tomb of, of approximately the same period, even if we didn't have all of the inscription and, and other kinds of evidence. Um, and there are, there's at least one other um, tomb in that area which also exhibits similar architectural features which which seems to suggest that it is a tomb of the same sort of time but there's um, there was very little very very little else to find in there to to give us very much to go on um, but yes the architecture of Valley of the King's tombs does um, evolve over time so even without inscriptions or anything else you could tell a um, Certainly you could tell a, let's say, later 19th dynasty or 20th dynasty tomb from an, eight, an early 18th dynasty tomb. Things are quite different. Um, yeah, there are lots of ways in which we can date those things, but, but architecture is one. Um, uh, Chris again says, I've been to the pyramids and Sphinx, many speculations about what's underneath the Sphinx. Um, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm going to park that question, I think, so we can keep to the, um, the Akhenaten stuff for now, but perhaps that's one for another another day um hope you don't mind um kaylee says incredible presentation chris oh that's a relief <laughs> um thanks kaylee just wondering do you have any opinions on who you think the female mummies kb 21a and 21b are i knew that i was going to get this question uh, this came up yesterday in the in the discussion so um kv 21 uh, which kaylee refers to here is a tomb which i think i'm right in saying kaylee was discovered by belzoni so in the early 19th century, and it was found to contain two, uh, two more of these unwrapped um, mummies, uh, a similar sort of situation to KB35, where you have the older lady and the younger lady and the, and the, and the male, young male in between. Um, these were then, I think, the two, am I right in saying the tomb was then sealed and only reinvestigated in much more recent times by Don Ryan? Um, and they were then included in the DNA analysis, I think. And this showed that um, KV21A, um, they're both mummies of female individuals, by the way. Um, KV21A, according to the DNA analysis, is the uh, mother of the fetuses, um, the mummified fetuses that were discovered in the tomb of Tutankhamun, in which case, um, 
uh, the, the, the obvious candidate for the identification of this mummy, the mother of the fetuses, is Tutankhamun's wife, Aung San Amun. Um, I, as far as I know, we haven't got anything better to go on than that at the moment. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think we always have to bear in mind that, um, that pharaohs, I th you know, most, most probably um, had m more than one consort um, but having said that, you know, that is, this is sort of pure speculation. We only know of Tutankhamun having had one, Anxan Amun. And so I, in the absence of any better evidence, I, I, th I think probably um, KV21A should be labelled as Amun, but with a big question mark, I think. Um, if, if I remember rightly, B, KV21B um, has been shown to be... Um, the mother of the KV twenty one A, is that right, or is that purely based on the uh, similar or similar situation in um, thirty five? Um, it, it's been suggested anyway that twenty one B could be Nefertiti, but um, but it, again, in, you know, it, it, it's very very difficult to say. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm less persuaded by that even. So, so question mark maybe. Um, but do let me know what, what, what your thoughts are on that, Kaylee. I might be interested to know. Um, Suzanne has just added to um, Ahmed's um, question about the Smenkare box to, to say that the names are found on the steps of Tutankhamun's tomb. I think you're right, Suzanne, that it was found in the entrance passageway, wasn't it? Um, by Carter. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Thank you. Um, oh, and Suzanne, and a question from Suzanne. Why do you think there's no mention of Tutank Aten Atamana when the six sisters are depicted many times, given that he was probably the son of Akhenaten and his sister, so not a very minor wife? Um, yeah, good question, Suzanne. Um, I covered this a little bit, actually, in my last talk. Um, there is a block, um, a, a decorated block, which was discovered at... Um, Hermopolis nearby, uh, which has the uh, goes by the, the name of the modern village El Ashmunain. Um, this was a sizable uh, city, um, and Ramesses II um, built um, monuments there using recycling stone from Amarna buildings. Um, and so a number of decorated um, Amarna period blocks have, have been found at Hermopolis. Um, including one which which is, um, uh, is preserves a fragment of um, an inscription in two parts. One of which gives the name of um, or uh, parts of the titulary in the name of a princess, um, but it's not clear um, who this was. Daughter of a king could be any one of the princesses. On the other side of the inscription, there's the name of the son of a king, and it appears to be Tutankhamun. Um, this is just about the only piece of evidence we have for the existence of um, Prince Tutankhaten at Amarna. Um, if the interpretation is right, then he was there. Great. There's very little else to, to show that he was, by the way. Um, as for why, if he was there, he wasn't depicted in, in all these scenes that we have of the royal family showing the daughters over and over again, it, it seems most likely this is just due to convention. Um, so it was actually very common for royal uh, female members of the royal family to be depicted in scenes or to be given prominence here and there um, one thinks for example of tomb complexes where you have the tomb of pharaoh but accompanied by um, in some cases the mother the wife or the daughters um, it's very very rare to see um, other male members of the royal family cropping up in such scenes or given prominence in, 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 in places such as tomb complexes. So the, the explanation that's been put forward is that uh, is that simply that that, that, that that male members of the royal family just don't feature. So even if they were there, they just wouldn't be shown in, in those family scenes. Um, that might seem implausible, but but that's that's the explanation. It might also explain why Smenkare, who may also have been a son of Akhenaten, um, doesn't crop up in any of these scenes. Um, it, it is odd. Um, it, it does seem odd, um, but but I think there is an explanation there. Um, 
Frankie says, there's much imagery of Akhenaten and his daughters. Uh, is there anything showing Akhenaten and, and Tutankhamun? Yes, uh, uh, yes, so that, that's essentially the same question. I, I hope that was a halfway decent answer. Um, Sarah says, have there been any investigations into the third KV-35 mummy? Is he a possible candidate for Smenkare? Um, I think the conclusion, Sarah, is in fact that it is Prince um, Thutmose, who was for some time, in fact, lined up to be the successor to Amenhotep uh, III. Um, I don't remember where the DNA analysis leads us on that. Um, forgive me, um, but I, but I think I think that's the consensus view. So so it was originally intended not that Amenhotep, son of Amenhotep the third, i.e. Amenhotep the fourth, Akhenaten, would succeed his father, but that it, that Amenhotep would be succeeded by a Thutmose, who would have become Thutmose the fifth. Um, but for one reason or another. Um, the plan changed perhaps because Thutmose predeceased his father. Um, Amenhotep III did, did reign and live for a long time. So it wouldn't be a massive surprise if, if um, his eldest or designated heir did predecease him. And I, I think that's the consensus view, but I admit I, I don't know that side of the story so well. Um, again, if that's a really burning question, um, perhaps drop me the line and, and drop me a line and I'll, 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 I'll look it up. Um, Arthur says, Belzoni's original account of the mummies in KV-21 describes them as being intact. He even comments on their hair. When the tomb was re-entered in more recent years, the tomb had been wrecked and the mummies despoiled. Wow, that's interesting, Arthur. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, it's a very strange, it's very strange to think, isn't it, that um, some of these, some of these tombs um, could have been entered in, um, in relatively recent times such as the early 19th dynasty. And then, you know, if they were not considered to contain material of sufficient value, then sometimes that material was just left behind. Um, so for, in fact, for example, um, the mummies of the elder lady, the younger lady, and um, the male individual in between, possibly Prince Thutmose, um, were still in the side chamber in KV-35 until a few years ago. So if I remember rightly, when Joan Fletcher conducted her investigation of the younger lady's mummy, she did that inside KV-35. Um, the, the chamber was simply walled up and they were left there. Um, and it was only after that point that they were remo removed and taken um, to, 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 to be a part of the Royal Mummies display in the Egyptian Museum. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it does seem odd, um, doesn't it? And, and of course we now know, sadly, um, that this this does mean that things, you know, mummies are that bit more vulnerable, um, perhaps to um, vandalism or you know robbery or whatever. Um, those of you who were at my last talk on Tutankhamun will know that, although it's still largely not discussed and sort of swept under the carpet, it seems very likely that the mummy of Tutankhamun, um, which has always remained in the tomb and is in the tomb to this day, um, was, uh, was taken apart was, and stripped of the last parts of its jewellery um, in around the time of the Second World War, um, when security in the valley was, was, was a bit lax, um, hence this being an unofficial story. But it sounds like maybe something similar happened in... KV21. I think I'm going to have to go away and do a bit of reading on KV21. As I say, the question came up yesterday and today. Um, perhaps there's um, <laughs> perhaps there's another talk to do. I am, I'm planning to do something on the Royal Mummies at some point, so maybe maybe I need to just round up these um, outliers um, uh, in in, a, in that talk. Um, uh, oh, I thought I'd got to the end of the questions, but I haven't. Um, was the young man in 35 tested for DNA? I don't know, Arthur. Yeah, I, that's why that's one of the things I need to go and um, I need to go and have a look at. Um, Kaylee says, oh, great, similar to my thoughts. Great, excellent, Kaylee. Glad we are on the same page. I thought the 21A mummies and Xenomoon due to DNA and mater maternal connections to the babies. I think it would have been helpful to test scientifically if there was a sibling relationship between 21A and Tutankhamun, as this may well solidify. Other, identify, other identities in the Amana line. Um, 
Yes, yeah, I, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we, we have to remember that the all of the results from the DNA analysis have been called into question on the basis that it, it, it it's some claim it's just simply not possible to get reliable enough samples of DNA, um, and also that the um, the results can be interpreted in different ways. Um, I make no claim to be an, an expert in the way DNA works or how it should be analysed. So I'm really just following the results um, as they were announced um, by Dr. Zahi and his team in, I think it was 2010. Um, those, those things have been called into question. Um, but I think by and large, you know, with that caveat, um, that, that they may not provide us with all the information. Um, you know the results are still a useful guide and, it, and certainly in some cases they have confirmed things that we suspected already such as the identity of the elder lady um oh chris scroll up to 12 54 i've asked the question you've missed sorry matisse um oops oh yes ah yes i see ah yes i see a sub Yes, okay. How did I miss that? Sorry, Matisse. If the DNA for the KV55 skull is 20 years old and is the father of Tutankhamun, does this mean Akhenaten is no longer the father of Tutankhamun? A bit confused by the detail. Should we ignore the DNA and stick with the inscriptional evidence? Um, and then there's a number of um, uh, subsequent um, questions. Um, the the conclusion that the mummy is 20 years old is not based on the dna it's it's based on the study of the skeleton um and um, and possibly the teeth i'm not sure um I, but i think mostly aspects of the skeleton those of you out there who are who have a biological background will probably know better than me but but the, it's not the dna that um, allows us to see that it's, it's the skeleton um it has been claimed elsewhere that um, such um, analyses of uh, the skeletal remains of individuals and do not allow us reliably to gauge the age of individuals. Um, so it's often um, mentioned, I think it was Aidan Dodson probably who first brought this into the, the debate that um, a number of skeletons were analysed um, during excavations of um, historic graves in um, in the city of London not long ago and it was shown in combination with various other kinds of evidence that the anatomists conclusions about the age and death of these individuals were often way off um, so there is a there is some doubt what among in some people's minds about the reliability of the, the anatomists conclusions um, uh, but yeah, but yeah, I think the important thing to remember here is that, it, and 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 I, I think this is a point I'd want to make more than any other, perhaps in this talk. It is often stated as though it is an incontrovertible fact that Tutankhamun's father was Akhenaten, and in fact, in the recent um, Tutankhamun exhibition, which was in Paris and then it was in London at the Saatchi Gallery, there was a family tree, a rather period family tree, which shows Tutankhamun's father was Akhenaten as if there's no question, and that's not right. Um, the, the inscriptional evidence su suggests it's Akhenaten. It doesn't point to anybody else. There can really only be two candidates, I think. We only know of two male royal individuals who haven't turned up elsewhere from this period, and that's Akhenaten and Smenkare. Um, and the, the problem here, and the reason we're still discussing this even now, is that the... The inscriptions all say Akhenaten and nothing else. The biology, if you like, says that it can't be Akhenaten, in which case it has to be Smenkare. But we, we, you just can't reconcile those two things. So um, in favour of the argument that it's Akhenaten, you just have to say, OK, the anatomists were wrong. Or Akhenaten came to the throne when he was about three years old, uh, you know, and, and that, that is the argument. So um, I think Zahi Huas has been one of the most vocal proponents of the idea that Akhenaten, it is Akhenaten's body, has, has simply said the anatomists are wrong. And actually sometimes bodies which appear to be 20 years old actually could be the bodies of people much older, could, maybe. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, I, 
it's a tricky business and we have to acknowledge that you know if if we are going to say that then we have to also be saying in that case all those anatomists are wrong um uh so i does that clear things up i i well <laughs> no it doesn't i'm sure it doesn't uh, it doesn't resolve the dis discussion but it but i think the important thing is, is that the discussion is not closed and, and it's often presented as though it is um I, that, that I've, I've i've always been very uncomfortable about that in tv documentaries and um not ones i've been in i hasten to add um, but TV documentaries, and as I say, the Tutankhamun exhibition, they, they're all very clear that Tutankhamun was, um, Tutankhamun's father was Akhenaten, and it's not unresolved. Um, now, Kavi says, I read somewhere that I pondered the KV, if, if the KV 55 individual is Smenkare and the younger lady is Mary Atten, um, and Mary Atten being Akhenaten's oldest daughter and being born early in his reign, this would mean she would have been about eight years old at the time therefore incapable of bearing children. In this case, the only real candidate for his father would be Smenkar Ray, which doesn't make sense. Perhaps the people who embalm the body believe the body was someone else at the grave goods don't concur with the age of the skeletal remains. Yeah, and that there is also that possibility, Kaylee, that, um, you know, we, we, we shouldn't perhaps rely on the inscriptions to allow us to identify the body. I think the thing about that is, if you take that thought too far, then then it's open season. And um, so, for example, you know, we have most of the bodies of the New Kingdom pharaohs from the royal caches, Theban tomb three twenty and um, and KV thirty five, and most of those individuals are identified on the basis of labels on the coffins or the mummy wrappings that they were found in. Um, and although sometimes doubt has been expressed about whether or not the labels were right, and we know that as part of the, the caching process, mummies were taken out of coffins, taken out of their wrappings, put back in coffins, rewrapped. It's not impossible to think that if there were lots of bodies and coffins and wrappings involved, then things might have got mixed up. Um, but I, but I, like I say, I think if you take that thought too far, then you almost abandon everything we've got and um i think we coming back to kb55 i think we have to remember that you know if if the inscriptions are of any use at all the as a guide then they are guiding us towards concluding that it's Akhenaten. but you know like i say I, I i i just don't think we can draw firm conclusions here and i think you just have to try and hold all of that in your mind hold the arguments in your mind and um i and and remember next time somebody somebody says on tv or whatever Tutankhamun, Tutankhamun's father was Akhenaten. Just remember, they can't be sure about that. Um, I hope that, um, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope that, um, I hope that works. Um, uh, Louise says, I was told that pre-World War II, Tutankhamun had his privates, but after World War II, it was gone. I don't know if that's true. You're right, Louise. Um, yeah, Tutankhamun was mummified with his penis erect, um, which appears to have been intended to evoke the idea of virility, fertility, um, but, it, but it, it came to be missing. Um, and there are a number of other you know and anomalies which um the the mummy exhibits now including the missing parts of the missing rib cage and part of the part of the pelvis is missing um which I th it's now i think reasonably clear are the result of the mummy having been visited um under the radar um in between carter closing the tomb or closing the sarcophagus with leaving the body behind in uh, whenever that was in the 1920s and the mummy being uh, re-examined by Rex Harrison in 1968. And in fact, it seems that the security breaches took place probably during the years of the Second World War. And uh, the reason uh, the mummy was revisited at that point was that Carter had had to leave certain pieces of jewellery on the body because they were glued on they were stuck fast um, by the embalming resins and there was no way for Carter to remove them 
uh, without doing further damage to the body. So the only option he had was to leave them on there. But of course, the robbers who were after the jewellery so they could resell it had no such qualms about damaging the mummy. So in order to get out the jewellery, which included some gold drop pendants, um, they just they just took the mummy apart. That's when the rib cage was removed. That's when the penis appears to have been dislodged. And in fact, um, that, that may well be when the fragment of bone that was loose in the cranial cavity came to be dislodged. And that's the fragment of bone that led to the theory that Tutankhamun had been struck on the head and murdered, um, which we now think was absolutely not true. Um, and like I say, that's confused a lot of us for a long time because that, that um, desecration of the mummy took place unofficially and it's still not really acknowledged officially probably because it's a bit of an embarrassment that the security of such an important um, tomb and such an important set of human remains was compromised. Um, so if you actually, if you visit, um, if you visit that page on my website, I mentioned the guide links and further reading uh, about my last talk on um, Tutankhamun, life, death and afterlife. Um, there's a there's mention of it in there and also of a, a very good article by Mark Gambold on what happened to that jewellery that was removed because it's just turned up um, a few years ago it turned up at an auction house um, and it's now in a private collection somewhere so that's some material from Tutankhamun's tomb which is now lost to us sadly. Um, Oh, I, I was hoping Arthur might chip in with some interesting um, biological knowledge that's beyond my expertise. Arthur says it is the fusion of the epiphyseal epi unions that can be used to age a skeleton up to the age of about 25 when the unions fuse and bone growth stops. So there we go. Um, further to my point that it's not the DNA that allows the aging of the skeleton, it's the, it's the skeleton itself. Um, there, there, that's the technical detail you need. Um, the author says, yes, Spitalfield's bodies were all, uh, all the things are jumping around here. Um, um, uh, oh, sorry, my screen is suddenly jumping around. I'm, I'm not sure where I am here. Uh, Arthur, on the, Arthur says, a touch penis I thought was found in the sand tray. Um, I'm not sure where it is is now actually um whether it was it certainly for a while was missing um i don't remember if it was restored but it was certainly it was intact in carter's time as in in place um and intact i th thought it was missing but it's another thing for me to go and look up um oh uh, arthur's comment about spitalfields has, has, has reappeared spitalfields bodies this is the city of london but bodies i mentioned all of older people, so the uncertainty of their aging has no relevance to age estimation based on epiphyseal fusion. Yeah. Which, as we know from Arthur's er earlier comment, only applies up to the age of 25. Um, Louise says, wow, I assumed it was rubbish. I was also told it was Americans, but I don't think they were in the fighting in that area in WW2. I'm not an expert. Louise, I'm not, I don't know on these raids on uh, the Valley of the Kings in the Second World War. I don't know how much is known about it. Um, there's a book uh, on the mummy by um, a science journalist, Joanna Marchant, which I'm now looking for. Um, here we go. Joe Marchant, The Shadow King, um, The Bizarre Afterlife of King Tut's Mummy. Um, I need to uh, revisit this, um, I think. Um, as I say, though, the whole thing is unofficial and um, it's not generally, it, lots of specialists who have looked at the mummy don't acknowledge it. Um, and in fact, um, when, I was, when I was first um, thinking seriously about the mummy of Tutankhamun, uh, which was for a documentary, um, I made in 2012, um, which eventually was broadcast in 2013 under the name The Mystery of the Burnt Mummy um, on Channel 4 in the UK. Uh, that, that, was, um, that was partly about uh, the possibility that he died in a chariot accident, um, also possibly about the possibility that the, the soft tissue spontaneously combusted. But on the chariot accident, um, the hypothesis starts with the fact of the, uh, the, the supposed damage to the torso, um, the evidence for which is uh, 
an, an unusual embalming scar, the missing heart, lots of packing inside the chest cavity and the missing rib cage and, and damage to the pelvis. Um, at the time, um, some of our colleagues at least um, attributed the damage to the rib cage, et cetera, to Carter. Um, they, they were clear about that. That never seemed to be very plausible to me because Carter is so clear in, in making note of the, the, the occasions when he has no option but to damage the mummy or other aspects of the tomb. And he says absolutely nothing about the rib cage. And as, as far as we can tell, he left everything in, intact. And in fact, the photographs made at the time by Harry Burton show that too. Um, so whether or not I don't know why. I don't know why it was that the, the, the our colleagues preferred to um, see the destruction as being the responsibility of Carter, but it, 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 it's the sort of consensus of this building in the literature here that actually it was these raids. Who who perpetrated them? I don't know. I think the problem was that security was lax, and then anybody who was in the area could have gone in to take these um, the last remaining jewels. It's an um, intriguing story. Um, okay, folks, so I think I'm at the end of the questions. And um, so I'll, I'll just um, just have a quick look at the uh, comments. Um, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, thanks um, thanks for, your, um, for your kind words, which I'm just sort of scrolling through very, um, very uh, quickly um, uh, here. Um, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, I, I, I ran this talk again, partly because it seemed like a nice compliment to my uh, my last one on, on Tutankhamun, and, and partly because I thought there might be a few people who hadn't heard it last time round who might might want to tune in, or a few people who might even want to listen in again, but it's been far more popular than I was expecting again. So um, there's, uh, there's obviously no limit to... <laughs> And people's interest in this topic. I should know this by now, shouldn't I? Anyway, um, so um, so thanks for, for coming along. Oh, I just see a quick question about um, next talk, um, Fiona. Um, I haven't got any more of my own lined up. I am doing three for the Glen Ira Libraries in Melbourne in May and June. Um, so those will take place early in the morning UK time, I think probably about 9am. Uh, UK time. Um, uh, those will be on. I'm sort of going over ground I've covered actually elsewhere, but sort of revising and expanding ideas. So there's one about the Amarna period um, where I'm going to be talking about Akhenaten and Nefertiti as, um, and their revolution as Egypt's punk rock moment. Wish me luck. Um, I'm going to be doing something about lost monuments. Um, which builds on my Egyptologist notebooks uh, related stuff, things from my last book. Um, oh, and um, uh, Egypt, I think I'm calling the third one Egypt Silver Pharaohs, which is about the royal tombs at Tanis and the um, third intermediate period. Um, so I'm going to be I'm going to be busy getting ready for those. Um, uh, and um, Otherwise, I'm not sure what's going to be next or when it will be. <laughs> Sorry. So watch this space. Um, hopefully not too long. I'm thinking Royal Mummy should be the should be the next one, not least as we've just had the great parade um, of mummies from the uh, Egyptian Museum to the new National Museum of, uh, of Egyptian Civilization. Um, but if um, uh, if you've got ideas, um, let me know. I've got I've got I've got a, I've got a few on a, a sort of list for possible next talks. So. If your ideas chime with mine, then that will perhaps help me prioritise. Um, yeah, <laughs> anarchy in the NK. I might just nick that, Arthur. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So, th so thanks, folks. I think I'll I'll um, I'll wind up now. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I hope to see you at another talk soon, whenever that's um, whenever that's going to be. Um, in any case, um, of course, all the details will go onto my website as soon as um, as soon as I have them and onto social media. So um, so do um, keep your eyes peeled and um, hope to see you again soon. Stay safe and well. In the meantime, enjoy the lifting of restrictions if um, if that applies to you where you are, um, and I'll see you again soon. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye.